Hey guys, in today's episode, I have on Robert Hockett. He is an Edward Cornell Endowed Professor of Law at Cornell Law School in Ithaca, New York, annual visiting professor of law at the Sorbonne Faculty of Law in Paris, France. I hope I pronounced that right. And senior counsel with Westwood Capital Group in New York City. Robert also does regular consulting work for the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, the International Monetary Fund, Americans for Financial Reform, the Occupy Money Cooperative, and a number of federal and state legislators, including advising U.S. Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. He has written for Forbes, and in today's episode, some of the things we talked about were Phase 2 of President Biden's reemergence plan, attributes of great leadership, how to solve the inequality problem, and much more. Without further ado, let's get into it. Three, two, one. Okay, Robert, thank you for coming on the show today. I really appreciate your time. Thank you, Jay. It really is an honor. I'm so glad you reached out, and it's so great that we can finally get this underway. <laughs> um, so before we kicked off the podcast, we were talking a little bit about phase two under the Biden administration, um, reopening the economy um, after COVID. Um, I was really hoping because you have so much expertise and you know, you've know you written articles for Forbes. I believe your most recent article was talking about phase two. Correct yeah. me if I'm wrong on that. That's right. um, but for my audience, can you kind of break it down with the bill that was just passed um, and what the next couple months we're shooting this in early March right now, this episode, you know, what does the future look like for the American people? Um, is there hope on the horizon? Um, I guess just break down the whole phase two plan and your perspective and ideas on that. Oh, sure. Yeah, thanks. What a, what a great question. Uh, it's a big question. Uh, and the, the main challenge is sort of how to kind of, I guess, structure or organize um, a reply to it to sort of that, that kind of keeps things orderly and understandable. So, I mean, maybe one way to to kind of help keep this big subject uh, kind of tractable uh, in our minds um, is to sort of, first of all, recall for ourselves um, sort of what the significance of the, of the pandemic uh, has been, right? And you can, it seems to me you can kind of, for convenience sake, kind of break down that significance into sort of two broad categories. Uh, on the one hand, um, you know, one big piece of the significance of the pandemic is just the pandemic itself and all of the harm that it has been causing, right? All of the death, all of the destruction, all of the loss of health, all of the social dislocation and dysfunction, um, the tremendous hit taken by the economy, the, the tremendous hit taken by society uh, as a whole, um, our political system and, and the like. Um, so that's that's sort of one bucket, you might say. Uh, and then the other bucket is sort of what sort of more longstanding uh, dysfunctions or sort of unhealthy conditions did the pandemic sort of reveal or perhaps just make more stark? In other words, what, what, what are the problems that were sort of there already or that had been there all along but had been, but had been sort of partly concealed uh, or obscured uh, by various things which the pandemic itself then sort of swept away thereby revealing right the dysfunctions um, if we sort of you know divide conversation into those sort of two categories broadly speaking um, then there's a nice kind of isomorphism with the Biden administration's plans right because um, so-called phase one um, which has just been completed in the sense that the uh, Relief Act has now finally been signed into law was basically, for the most part, targeted at that sort of first category that I identified, right? The, 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 the problems wrought by um, the pandemic itself. Um, and then phase two, to which we're sort of turning or pivoting now, um, which also, again, was sort of planned all along, um, is aimed more at those kind of longer standing, more sort of deep structure uh, dysfunctions um, that the pandemic didn't so much cause as either reveal or exacerbate uh, or, or, or both, right? So um, maybe would you like me to begin by saying a little bit about um, phase one, uh, a little bit about, in other words, the Relief Act, and hence a little bit about the harms that were wrought by the pandemic itself, you know, sort of apart from the already longstanding problems that the pandemic merely revealed. Yeah, I think a little background of phase one would really help emphasize the points you make in phase two. 
Great. Okay. So um, <clears throat> if we sort of maybe start with that first category then, and if we sort of subcategorize it a little bit further, um, we might, you know, sort of roughly divide um, <clears throat> the, uh, the difficulties or the problems that were sort of wrought by the pandemic itself into maybe three subcategories, right? We might say on the one hand, there's just the public health concern, right? There's the, the, there's the matter of just human death and uh, human um, illness, um, uh, longstanding uh, uh, sort of lack of health, even on the part of survivors, right? Or at least long uh, sort of ongoing or sort of, you know, well into the future um, uh, health vulnerabilities that people who have been infected are going to have. So there's that sort of public health uh, aspect. Um, there's also uh, a kind of national economic uh, aspect, a macroeconomic and financial uh, uh, aspect of the pandemic as such. Um, as you know, um, you know, there were mass, uh, well, there's a mass shutdown, basically, or at least a significant degree of shutdown of the economy as a whole, as workplaces had to shut down temporarily, as people had to be furloughed and uh, shelter in place uh, at their homes and the like. Um, and that, of course, threatened us with massive economic uh, contraction and then further sequelae that follow on that kind of contraction, like people possibly losing their homes, not being able to keep current with their rents, not being able to keep current with their mortgages, um, all of those kind of general sort of material life uh, concerns that are not specifically health concerns um, that were also raised simply by the economic uh, consequences of the pandemic. And then finally, thirdly, and, and quite closely relatedly, um, we could uh, say would be the fiscal consequences for basically public financing, right? Just basically for the continued functioning of of uh, of governments or of uh, public agencies of various kinds that are themselves reliant on continued income flow and hence continued economic activity such that the sort of curtailment of that activity would inevitably uh, pinch the budgets of those um, government entities in question. Uh, and in particular here, I have in mind the states and the cities, um, because unlike the federal government, uh, the states and the cities don't have, in effect, unlimited bar uh, um, borrowing power, or at least not, they don't have sort of indefinitely extended uh, borrowing power. Their budgets are more constrained. Um, they can't issue their own currencies. Uh, that would be counterfeiting. Um, they are basically reliant on, on a sort of continued income flow in order to be able to sort of operate. And that was especially significant for present purposes because they were the frontline responders to all of the aforementioned public health consequences of the pandemic, right? I mean, we do have federal agencies which are federally funded and which in theory, therefore, can be sort of indefinitely funded and financed. Um, that's sort of what the federal government is for. But, you know, as, as we know, uh, during those uh, Trump years, the federal government was sort of spectacularly incompetent and, imbecilic uh, in, in, in Alexander Hamilton's un, uh, sort of sense of the term imbecilic, just sort of inert, you know, lacking in agency, lacking in coherent agency. It was just not compass mentis in a sense, right? And what that meant was that the instrumentalities of government that we have that are not financially constrained in any sort of immediate term sense were precisely the ones that weren't functioning, right? And so we had to rely more on the state and city um, governments, which were functioning. Um, and yet those are precisely the ones that aren't able to finance themselves. And so, so that sort of third bucket or that third sort of subcategory of concerns raised by the pandemic as pandemic um, was very important as well. Now, um, given that backdrop, uh, it's fairly easy to kind of categorize the um, contributions made by the Relief Act or the significance of the um, of phase one uh, as well, right? Because in a sense, um, phase one or the Relief Act basically responds sort of sequentially or sort of, you know, across the board uh, to all of the sort of multiple concerns that fall under those sort of three uh, subcategories, right? So when it comes to public health itself, of course, um, you know, quite saliently, quite conspicuously, um, the bill, uh, or now the law, um, has all sorts of provisions uh, to jumpstart uh, vaccine manufacture and vaccine distribution, 
provisions to jumpstart more immediate response provision, more health care, more um, sort of hospital uh, facilitation, uh, I'm sorry, more hospital facilities, more hospital capacity or medical capacity to deal um, with the pandemic. Um, Similarly, uh, and what one could go into more detail, but I, since I guess we're, we're aiming to get to phase two, I'll, I'll be fairly broad brush here. Um, uh, when it comes to the sort of second subcategory, um, uh, those sort of fiscal and, uh, and economic um, uh, consequences sort of in the real economy, um, as you know, of course, there's been, um, there's, there are further relief checks uh, in the offing going out to all uh, in order both to sort of enable people to kind of remain current on their mortgages or on their, on their rents, on their grocery bills, and just basically their living expenses. Uh, and in order also to maintain consumer demand uh, in the aggregate economy, so as to keep productive activity underway, because of course, when there's a lack of demand, when, pe when basically people are not buying, and when inventories are building up on the shelves, so to speak, that's precisely when firms tend to sort of slow things down, then maybe lay off more workers, which then contracts spending power even more, which then leads to more layoffs and the sort of classic downward spiral that we associate with recession or depression, uh, great or otherwise. Um, so the, the relief payments are about that and various other forms of relief um, uh, are also you know, sort of about that, right? So um, there are supports in the bill to the restaurant industry, uh, to other small businesses that have been especially hard hit by the pandemic, precisely because their business is in a realm where people's staying home uh, is a threat to the business model itself. Um, and uh, so you could sort of say, you know, oh, and there's of course child care credits um, to basically uh, pro provide further uh, assistance to families who not only have the usual expenses, but maybe have the expenses of, of, of young children, uh, maybe even newly born children as well. So there's, there's a whole lot of stuff in there um, about the sort of the immediate economic needs um, that are themselves needs raised by the pandemic, which will, you know, I think most people at this point, the weight of expert opinion is that those will sort of continue to be needs with a certain degree of urgency, you know, sometime into the summer, um, you know, maybe up until August or so. Now, you know, hopefully, you know, ideally we might end up being sort of pleasantly surprised. Maybe everything will get, you know, sort of back to normal when it comes to productive activity and so forth, even before then, maybe by May, um, since the vaccine seems to be uh, being distributed pretty effectively now. And since life seems to be sort of gradually kind of coming to be restored, um, we might, you know, beat the clock, so to speak, and, and, and come out of this even sooner. But the bill was sort of drafted on the understanding that, well, we ought to plan for the worst case scenario, um, just to make sure that we're not sort of blindsided. And then if it turns out that the worst case scenario is not the scenario, we can always revisit um, and say, oh, I guess we can, looks like we don't have to kind of keep this relief going as long as we thought we might. But anyway, so that's, that, that's, those measures are all sort of about that kind of second subcategory of, of concerns or matters that, I'm, uh, that I sort of identified. Uh, and then finally, thirdly, uh, there's a good bit in there um, of aid to states and cities, municipalities, um, all of these, what I was calling frontline uh, responders, um, sort of an express recognition of the fact uh, that these governmental entities don't have the same financing capacities or even the same legal powers to finance themselves uh, that federal agencies have, right? So there's a good bit of aid that's gone directly to the states and the cities. And what's especially, I think, to be welcomed here is that sort of unlike what we did with the CARES Act almost exactly a year ago, namely extending credit to cities and states, enabling the, them to borrow a little bit more cheaply um, in order to sort of finance their uh, first responder activities uh, to the pandemic, um, a lot of this is just outright grant money, right? We're just saying here, you don't have to pay it back, right? You've already incurred enough debt in doing the jobs that the federal government should have been doing in the first place, but couldn't because it was the Trump federal government. Um, so here, here's here's your sort of here's the payback for that, right? In, in effect, you can almost look at it as a kind of you know partly a kind of loan forgiveness or something, almost a kind of a retroactive uh, cancellation 
of some of the debts that cities and states had to incur, not in, the, in any direct sense, not, not because there was a cancellation, but because in extending just grant money like this, you basically free up uh, other state revenues and the like that might have had to go toward continued pandemic response to be used instead to you know, pay off uh, any debts that were incurred or to redeem any bonds that had to be issued extraordinarily in order to finance pandemic response. So that's, in a nutshell, again, I, 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 in, in one sense, I'm not doing the bill justice because it's really big and there's a lot in there. Um, but if one needed a kind of a broad brush characterization, I think that's probably a, a, fair, a fair view of it. Um, and so as you can see, what all of this has in common is it's A, sort of responding to the pandemic as pandemic, um, rather than to sort of longer term, deep structure features of our economy, even though it will have an impact on those things. Um, and two, um, in consequence, because the pandemic is thought likely to sort of wind down uh, in the coming months, um, what the bill does itself will partly uh, be winding down in coming months as well even though some of it will be uh, longer term and, and continue on beyond that. Something that I'm confused about, and correct me if I'm not understanding this correctly, but from reading parts of the bill, uh, there's a portion of the money that's going to be in the second phase allocated towards tests, COVID tests. Mm -hmm. But if we're pushing shots out there, why does money need to be allocated? And by the time it's distributed efficiently, towards more testing? Yeah, I think uh, it's a great question, Jay. I think a couple things on that. Um, one is that in order to sort of feel sure, uh, in order to, to be able actually even to be reasonably confident um, that the vaccines are working, that the pandemic is indeed sort of, um, you know, sort of monotonically diminishing in its significance rather than kind of cycling or kind of, you know, two steps forward, one step backing. Um, it's important to be able uh, to test and to test effectively and quickly and well. Um, and then secondly, and sort of relatedly, I think developing a general capacity uh, to test quickly and responsibly uh, is going to be a kind, it's going to reap long-term benefits too. In other words, it's, it, we're developing and doing this a capacity that is likely to be called upon again, right? Um, this is not the last pandemic that we're going to experience, right? I mean, the, the weight of scientific and epidemiological opinion out there is that <clears throat> we're sort of entering into an age of pandemics that will sort of increase in frequency and intensity and in lethality um, on average um, um, for some time to come, um, partly because there just seem to be, it's partly an environmental thing um, as um, sort of the reclamation or just the clumation of various lands and, and pieces of the earth that have previously been uninhabited or in which people have not come into close contact. Um, <clears throat> humans are being brought into contact with more stuff, you know, more pathogens that can, you know, sort of jump from one species to another. Also, the sort of crowding of people more closely together in certain places as populations continue to grow makes us more uh, vulnerable. Um, and then finally, um, you know, this is, of course, a longer term trend that phase two is addressed to, but insofar as this has been a trend up till now, um, the sort of heightening degrees of inequality um, in certain societies, especially American society, but also across the so-called industrialized or wealthy nations more, more generally, and also in some, you know, kind of newly becoming wealthy societies like, like China's, uh, itself, I think, is expected to sort of render us as a species more vulnerable for some time to come uh, to pandemics, um, to outbreaks of various kinds. And so insofar as that's the case, um, it's probably going to be pretty important just to have a generalized capacity to do uh, testing and contact tracing for the next one, even if um, for this one, um, it's a little late and should have really been in place like a year ago. That, you know, it's, it's maybe worth noting in this in this connection, a couple of uh, quick, quick items. One is that the countries or the societies that sort of fared best um, during this very pandemic, interestingly enough, were precisely the ones that had in place 
the most effective systems of testing and contract tracing or contact tracing. Um, as you know, South Korea, uh, Taiwan, Singapore, a number of the East Asian countries um, did spectacularly well in a per capita sense uh, compared to the US. Similarly, uh, in Oceania, uh, New Zealand, of course, did spectacularly well, um, maybe better than any other country on a per capita basis, although I haven't checked the numbers lately. And what all of these uh, countries had in common was very effective systems of testing and contact tracing. So they could very efficiently act to kind of tamp down sort of hotspots, as we might call them, uh, as they emerged thereby preventing them from spreading and joining in the way that different pockets of a wildfire when they join make the fire much bigger. Um, so if past is prologue and if we can draw lessons from their experience, one would seem to be that, yeah, we really ought to have that kind of capacity. And that's something, again, that the Trump administration just doesn't seem to have thought of as being a thing. Um, but in, in fairness, many separate US states don't seem to have done particularly well on this either. That might be partly because they had funding constraints of a kind that the feds don't. But it might also just be that they just weren't really thinking very well or carefully. Um, then the second thing maybe worth noting in this connection is that one of the most important legacies uh, of the, the Obama-Biden uh, administration that the Trump administration just cavalierly jettisoned almost immediately was uh, an office devoted to precisely this kind of thing, right? And a set of protocols that they were developing because um, the Obama-Biden administration experienced, of course, SARS and, um, and the beginnings of an Ebola outbreak. They responded quickly and effectively and well and coordinated also very carefully with their counterparts in other jurisdictions abroad. Another thing, of course, that uh, Trump wasn't particularly um, um, celebrated for. Um, and they sort of realized um, that they had sort of dodged a bullet. I think there was a kind of a, a deep sigh of relief that was heaved um, in late 2014 and 2015 that, my God, this could have been really dreadful, right? This could have been like something out of a really bad, you know, Michael Crichton novel or film, you know? And so I think they, you know, they had the good sense to say, look, um, let's not <clears throat> let's not rely on luck next time, right? Um, let's see to it that we don't have to be lucky next time, in other words. Um, and then, of course, the I mean, Trump admin just sort of <laughs> you know, viewed that as a sort of, you know, what the, what the hell is that? I mean, who needs that? You know, who, <laughs> who needs co collaboration? Who needs cooperation? But um, <clears throat> so um, one way of viewing, I think, the, the sort of testing um, uh, provisions or the testing financing and testing facilitation provisions um, of the Relief Act is as kind of restoring and even expanding um, that sort of structure that was beginning to be put into place uh, at the end of the previous uh, civilized or at least relatively civilized administration. Got you. Um, so correct me if I'm wrong, <laughs> but um, well, actually, don't. Th there's nothing correct here. It's actually just a question. Um, the the tests for COVID. Let's say we have another pandemic three years from now. Those tests can be reused if properly stored mm -hmm. for another outbreak. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Then. Yeah, I think that's. Um, I think that. Um, I mean, I, I want to say sort of yes and no. I mean, if they're properly stored, they can be reused. They can be used still for you know current COVID, let's say, uh, and variants of current COVID that don't sort of mutate too far away from the original base. Um, presumably it's possible. I don't know what the probabilities are. Um, it's, it's just not something that I sort of track and, and calculate, but um, <clears throat> I think this is, I think this would just basically be subject to statistical uh, laws um, that at some point, you know, variations can be such that older tests aren't as effective. Maybe they're only 50% effective or 70% effective or whatever, sort of in the way that vaccines are, right? You know, like a vaccine itself that is developed for one strain of something or in response, let's say to one strain, 
can oftentimes be used for other strains as well, but the efficacy sort of diminishes um, the further variation, the, the more variations there are, or the sort of the, 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 the larger the number of iterations of variation. So there's a kind of a diminishing efficacy um, of vaccines as viruses mutate. And I think the same goes for the tests. So, so I don't want to sort of overstate that, but, um, but it's nevertheless there. It's, it's, it's nevertheless true. So there's that as well. It won't be like a total waste then from that point of view either. So if we think of this then as being partly about having tests available that will have at least some degree of efficacy in future if they're needed. And if we think of it partly also as a matter of just putting in place a kind of a protocol or a set of procedures uh, or, or, or practices that can then become a kind of habit, kind of a, a sort of a familiar pattern of response that we then have on the shelf, as it were, um, then we're better prepared for the next one um, when it comes. And we're better prepared then to prevent the next one from being anything like this one in terms of its magnitude uh, or its devastation. So last time I heard, the origins of the virus came from a lab in China. Is that still the case? Or is it from a food market in Wuhan? Do you know I guess, um, are better, rather better informed on the origins of the virus, because you were saying that, you know, this isn't the last big virus we've seen. I'm just uh, curious of the origins and um, where, if you we were going to predict in the future, another one could arise from. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think, um, you know, as far as I can tell, the the sort of the jury is still out on, on, on that one in the sense that um, there are a number of, of theories, um, most of, or at least uh, more than one of these theories uh, is plausible as, as being possibly uh, the story uh, here, but there's a great deal of controversy over which one or ones, you know, is or are uh, true. Um, matters, of course, aren't helped by the fact that there's a kind of a political significance and even to some extent a kind of you know, ethical and um, political and um, what's, what am I looking for? It's the word I'm looking for. Even a kind of, um, you know, let's just say human moral significance to this, because um, as, as we know, you know, Trump sort of tried to racialize it in a certain sense, uh, or at the very least was sort of trying to kind of politicize it as a kind of China thing. And that, as we know, has led to, you know, actual physical assaults on Asian Americans, or people in the United States uh, of Asian ethnicity by some of these more atavistic sort of Trump supporters. And, and that makes it harder in a sense, even just to be forthright uh, about what the origin is, because you have to worry like, what if it were like, what if there were like a 10% or 15% chance that it originated um, in, in Wuhan or in China? Um, but there, uh, I'm sorry, let's imagine there was like a 90% chance that it originated in, in, in Wuhan or in China and a merely 10% chance that it, it didn't. Under ordinary circumstances, if you were simply being just honest, you'd say, well, yeah, I guess there's a 90% chance that it originated there. But what you have to do now is knowing that talking that way or propagating that, that truth, even if, assuming it's a truth that there's a 90% chance, you have to sort of add in that, well, there's at least some possibility that it's false. And yet, nevertheless, you know, a bunch of Trump supporters are going to attack people you know, physically. So maybe we better just not talk about it so much. Let's kind of lower the temperature by lowering the number of incidences that we even talk about this subject of origin. Um, and in a way, I mean, this is one of the great tragedies of this situation, right? Because this is in the realm of, of, of science. This is in the realm of, of knowledge, not mere opinion. Um, and ordinarily then you'd want to be able simply to traffic in knowledge, right? Um, and not worry about opinion. But because opinion in this case has been made such a, a highly charged thing, a politically significant or politically charged thing, that in itself um, stands to elicit uh, or, in st in, in, or stoke violence, you kind of have to <clears throat> almost say, well, all right, the, the science of this almost has to be kind of set aside because we have to think a little bit at least of possible awful consequences of just people getting the wrong idea um, from something that we say, even though when we say it, it's strictly speaking not really warranting 
these these overreactions. So <clears throat> that's sort of the, the problem we're faced with. And 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 so one um, one upshot of it, one sort of practical practical upshot uh, for me at least of that state of affairs is. Um, I'm sort of inclined not to worry too much uh, or, or wonder too much about specifically where it broke out or where it originated and, and, and to think instead about how it broke out. Um, and of course, in one sense, those aren't completely separable, right? Like if you say, oh, it's, it was a wet market in Wuhan, um, well, then you're saying it was Wuhan. On the other hand, if, if the focus is on, oh, wet markets or certain kinds of markets, then we can take the focus off of this particular case and just say, well, where are there markets like this where, you know, various critters are, you know, stored in inhumane conditions next to each other where viruses can kind of jump from species to species. And that's, of course, not, not by a long shot, is that only in China, right? I mean, there are markets like that in the U.S. as well. Um, <clears throat> indeed, I would not be at all surprised. I mean, this is just a quick sort of aside, but as you know, there are some parts of the United States where the pork industry has these huge, you know, stockyards. Um, um, Kansas, for example, I, I think Iowa beef still has a gigantic pork stockyard uh, out in the western part of the state of Kansas, right in the center of the United States. You can almost think of Kansas as being kind of like the, the Wuhan of America in the sense that it's sort of right there in the middle. Um, and all these hogs are, you know, stuffed really close together. Um, you can smell these locations from like 100, 200 miles away sometimes because the, the scents are so intense and then they're carried by the wind. Um, it wouldn't be in any way surprising, right, if some, you know, kind of awful thing broke out among hogs uh, in Kansas and then spread all over the U.S. and then to the world. And so, it, you know, given that, given the fact that you've got conditions of this sort in all sorts of facilities, poultry farms in the U.S. as well, um, and then in other countries as well, um, it seems to me that um, the, the, the location, <clears throat> it, sorry, if a wet market is where COVID developed, <clears throat> it seems to me that the location of that wet market is much less interesting than the fact of it's being a wet market, or maybe even um, less interesting than the fact that it is a venue in which lots of animals are crammed together, whether it's a wet or a dry venue. You know, so to speak. So in any event, that's the way I, I sort of try to think about it is like, um, even though you can't strictly speaking completely and totally practically separate um, the specific location of origin on the one hand and the modality of the origination, right, the sort of mechanism of the origination on the other hand, you can at least analytically separate them or conceptually separate them. And if you do that, you sort of see at once, well, what's the thing that matters? Well, it's the, it's the mechanics, it's the modality, it's not really the specific location, at least, at least not now, right? I mean, the location would have mattered if we, if we could have said, oh, ground zero, you know, like a year ago or a year and a half ago, <clears throat> if we could have said, um, it's right there. Well, then, yeah, then it would matter because we said we have to quarantine right there, right? But at this point, the cat is so well out of the bag and has been for a year, over a year, actually, that it's almost sort of doesn't matter where it came uh, from. It, it, what matters is how it came from there. I agree uh, on the, the astute observation that it matters how it originated and not where it originated, assuming that it came from a wet market um, and uh, it originated from that because that could come anywhere in the world, reiter reiterating what you just said. However, if it came from a lab in a certain country, that's a completely different animal in itself. Um, yeah. And, you know, that could be a conspiracy theory. That could be truth. At this point, I don't think we have the evidence to say what is what. And I don't know if we'll ever be able to really get that evidence um, because, like you said, some people attacked Chinese people or Asian people because of the way it was portrayed as the Chinese virus by, uh, by the American leadership at that time. Um, and I don't think under the current administration, if it does come out to be true from a lab, and this is just me speculating at this point, that that type of behavior would be acceptable. Um, so I don't know if we'll ever actually find out the truth. That'll be interesting to see how that comes about. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you raised some really good concerns when talking about the Trump administration um, and their handling of this. And I want to get your opinion on leadership. Mm. Um, you know, 
through the history of time, we've seen many different leaders with different priorities. Um, I'm sure you have your own opinions on leaders. Um, and I'm really curious to hear, what do you think makes a great leader? Uh, you know, growing up, I was always taught that the president was supposed to be the greatest leader in America, um, probably in the world, to be honest, because we're such a powerful nation. Um, but everyone is flawed at the end of the day. A human being can't be perfect. So every leader is going to have their own priority. Um, what would be your idealistic version of a well-rounded leader? Oh, what a great question, Jay. That's just absolutely fantastic. I, um, it's, some, it's, it's really a question that probably we ought to, you know, it ought to be sort of like a thing, um, if I can put it that way. It ought to be sort of on the national agenda. People ought to be asking themselves that, you know, maybe on a daily basis for a while, just so that we can kind of remind ourselves of what we what we want, what we desire, what we need, what we demand, and and we can kind of evaluate um, putative leaders, um, you know, kind of accordingly. We're probably not self-conscious enough, in other words, about what we really want or are looking for uh, in leaders, and insofar as we're not, we're probably more easily um, moved by kind of ad hoc, um, uh, contingent characteristics of people that just turn out to be salient, like, oh, you know, she's got a great, you know, sort of speaking voice, or she's got a really witty, smart way of talking, or he's got a kind of charisma or whatever. Um, those things matter, but it'd probably be good if we actually asked ourselves kind of systematically and sort of self-consciously what does matter, as you've just done. So um, when I try to address that, when I think about that question, I guess I think that um, a really great leader um, that would have a number of characters. One would be that the leader would be mindful of her or his jurisdiction, right? What are you a leader of, in other words? And what is the purpose of that entity uh, or arrangement or group of people that you're a leader of? So you'd wanna be, you can think of that almost as being, you know, a kind of mandate consciousness, right? Be, be fully cognizant of and attentive to what your actual mandate is, what your actual role is. So a leader of a country um, has a somewhat different role, of course, than the leader of, let's say, um, a church congregation or a religious colony or um, uh, um, uh, a group of people who have formed like an intentional community, um, let alone of a mayor or um, a governor or a school principal, right, or a leader of a company or something. So there's that. Um, next, I think, um, I think a leader probably has to be curious. You want a leader to have a kind of an inquisitive mind, um, a kind of in a sense, a kind of intellectually hungry mind, a mind that's kind of looking, who's, who's sort of intrigued by things, um, partly because it seems to me that part of the leaderly role in almost any organizational setting um, is to be sort of on the lookout for um, approaches to challenges that face whatever the organization is in pursuing what it's there to pursue, right? Various obstacles that stand in its way, various challenges that confront it as it's um, moving toward its goal or trying to accomplish what it's there to accomplish. Um, you know, um, a lot of the role of a leader is essentially to kind of enable whatever the leader is leading to kind of get past certain things that that sort of stand in the way of that man of achievement of that mandate, as I mentioned, as I referred to it before, that particular like mission. So you need then a kind of mission consciousness or mandate consciousness on the one hand. And then that leads you to attending to the particular obstacles that stand in the way to the achievement of that mission or, or the accomplishment of that mandate. And that requires, I think, again, a kind of an intellectual curiosity, a kind of a creativity of intellect. So that would be uh, number two. Um, number three, and by the way, when I order, you know, number one, two, three, I, I don't, this is like not an order of importance. They might, they might all be equally important. I just really haven't given enough thought to whether there's a hierarchy here, but, yeah, I completely but understand. they're sort of coming to mind in this order. Um, so a, a third, uh, um, I think, attribute that's, that's necessary is a kind of uh, humility or egolessness. Um, and this is somewhat difficult, I think, especially in, in, in Western tradition, in, in sort of Western ethical traditions, it's somewhat difficult um, to sort of have a leader 
who has that kind of humility, because there's a tendency for us to sort of associate, for whatever reason, leadership with ego or leadership with self-assertion, like, you know, I'm, I'm the natural leader of this group, or I deserve to be leading be following me because I'm smarter or more creative or more forceful a personality. Or we have such a tendency to sort of think in terms of self-assertion when we think in terms of leadership and hence to think in terms of a kind of self-confidence that is somehow grounded in a form of self-consciousness that involves self-elevation. But as we know, um, there's those, those are not, those are sort of, I think, accidental associations that are the product of, again, uh, a tendency, especially in, 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 in Western conceptions of leadership to sort of associate these things in a kind of Pavlovian way and then kid ourselves into thinking that even though they're just randomly and Pavlovianly associated, that they're actually somehow deeply connected, that you somehow can't have the one without the other. And, and that, that, that's simply false. Um, now, it seems to me that in some other uh, uh, civilizational traditions, um, there's a much more, you know, there's, there's a much healthier sort of understanding that leadership does not have to be self-assertion uh, or ego, um, that one can in effect lead by example or lead by being inspiring or lead by the clarity of her or his moral vision, which is so clear and so powerful that people just sort of follow uh, or join, maybe is a better way of putting it, because they realize, oh, you know, she has given this so much thought that she has actually addressed questions in her own mind that I myself have had in mind, but she's addressed them so well, maybe because she's so smart, maybe because she's just given them so much time, maybe because she's just so morally earnest, that she is able actually to formulate the questions that I myself have more clearly than I myself have ever been able to do. And that has resulted in her being able to answer those questions. So she's now arrived at the point in her own sort of moral and mental life that I kind of was groping toward and wanted to get to. So <clears throat> I'm gonna go ahead and go, I'm gonna join her. I'm gonna go with her on this, on this particular voyage, on this particular journey or this mission. Um, and there have been you know, great figures um, throughout human history that I think sort of fit this, this model. And while I seem to be kind of slagging the West and in saying the West tends to associate self-assertion with this, some of them have been in the West as well. Um, the ones I think are probably, you know, some of those who come first to mind, you know, obviously somebody like Gandhi um, uh, would, would be one. Um, I think um, in your in your own um, uh, familial tradition, as I understand it, Jay, probably Ashoka would count. Um, uh, they're in the, in the kind of Central Asian, Middle Eastern, you know, just Southeast of Europe sort of tradition. Uh, the figure of Christ is, um, at least on some conceptions, understood uh, that way. Uh, and, you know, on some of the accounts, some of the Gospels, even some of the non, you know, especially in a lot of the non-canonical uh, Gospels, uh, Christ is uh, essentially of that character. He's somebody who just had a kind of a, a clarity of moral vision because he set himself apart for a while to meditate and think. And then people just followed him. He didn't have to say, I'm the leader here. I'm smarter than you. I know what's what. And of course, you know, there is a, there is a tradition uh, that uh, the, the so-called lost years of Jesus were spent in Srinagar, right? That he actually was in a uh, either a Jain or a Buddhist uh, monastery in his uh, late youth and early adulthood before then going back to his homeland. Um, <clears throat> but I've always thought that significant, right? That even the probably the, 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 the most celebrated moral figure in the so-called West might actually himself have an, an Eastern, uh, at least a, part, a partly Eastern uh, formation. Um, other figures, um, you know, obviously uh, the Reverend Martin Luther King uh, here in the West is probably one of the, if not the most uh, renowned and revered moral leader um, in sort of this hemisphere, who of course himself was uh, very much inspired both by, by Christ and by, by Gandhi. Um, but then even somewhat more prosaically and less exaltedly, um, George Washington uh, is very uh, highly regarded still uh, by historians um, because, you know, even the ones, even so-called revisionist historians who are always like on the lookout 
for evidence uh, or justification to debunk um, historically lionized figures uh, end up, you know, coming away from looking into all of the, you know, the deep historical record on, on, on Washington and sort of saying, God, you know, this guy, he actually kind of was what he purported to be. I mean, he actually was on the level. He was, now obviously he was profoundly flawed having, um, you know, participated in a slave owning culture and having owned slaves and the like. So I don't want to, I don't want to portray him as some sort of a saint, but uh, by any, you know, by any stretch. And, and you know, Gandhi and King and uh, would have been the first to admit that they were saints either in, in the kind of like moral perfection sense. But, but one thing that all of these folk seem to have had in common is they weren't self-assertive in the sense of like, you know, like a Donald Trump where they're saying, you know, just claiming the role, just saying, follow me because I know more or I have a very good brain, you know, or I, uh, I'm, I'm smarter than you are, or I'm, I've got a forceful personality. Or I, I'm just, I'm blessed with a kind of a magic. Everything I touch turns to gold. I'm King Midas. I'm, I'm, um, you know, everything I, I, I I'm sort of, um, I have the magic touch or whatever. They were all, none of them did that, right? What they did was they simply fixated their vision on what the goal was and what the right way of being was. And then they exuded a kind of magic that comes with that. So as I understand it from all of the, the reading that I've done of, uh, in the sort of American revolutionary era, they followed Washington, not because he said, follow me or look at me. In fact, he didn't even want to lead. You know, he tried to, he tried to say, now, nah, you know, I just want to be on my farm. But they just thought, holy crap, you know, everybody wants to be this guy. This guy is really cool. Um, and so he just was what, you know, somebody like Trump is sort of trying to be or claiming to be or talking about being. Um, and I think it was largely the same, obviously, with, with Gandhi, right? Gandhi preached plenty, but Gandhi just was Gandhi. He lived Gandhi. Uh, and King lived King. And I think of that as a kind of humility. Um, you know, it's, it, it requires a certain sort of um, chutzpah, I guess you could say, to be ready to lead a huge movement. But the key, the thing that makes it uh, sort of real leadership and humility rather than sort of self-assertion is that it's not like self-conscious leadership in the sense that you're you're saying you, that you view yourself as having a right to lead because you're in some sense better. Um, instead, you take yourself out of it in a certain sense and you just keep your eyes sort of fixed on the ball. You know, there, there was this sort of, um, this is going to sound like a really silly example in a way, but I remember in a film uh, once there was a scene where some guy is trying to master um, the way of the samurai cudgel, you know, sort of stick fighting or whatever. Uh, I think it was that, or maybe it was with swords or something, but <clears throat> in any event, and he just kept losing uh, in these like little sort of sparring matches. Uh, and finally, somebody, you know, intervenes for a second and says, too many mind, you know, you're, you're sort of thinking about yourself doing this. And that's in, it's in the way that's preventing you from, from actually doing what needs to be done, um, that it's actually the self consciousness, that's the problem here. Um, so he said, you know, you have, you know, mind on self, mind on stance, mind on stick, mind on, and then too many mind, uh, and then says something like no mind, um, you know, speaking very simply. Um, and then the guy suddenly does really well, um, <laughs> which is, again, which is what makes the whole moment sort of like a cartoon sort of silly, but, but there's something really profound in that, right? Even in sort of goofy pop culture, you can sometimes find really profound messages. It seems to be, and there the key is you just take your bloody self out of it, you know, just don't, don't be looking at yourself doing this. Um, just be looking at this. <laughs> and if you just look at this, then you can do this. Whereas if you're looking at doing this when you're doing it, then you're not really going to do it. And I think that leadership is maybe a bit like that, right? That if you're thinking of how literally am I being now? Do I look like a leader? What am I projecting here? You know, then you're really going to flub it up. Um, and you're really going to, you know, you're going to take a pratfall. But if you're just, so I think that's sort of something along those lines is what I have in mind by, by humility when I, when I say that. And it seems to me, Jay, that if you have those three things, you're probably fairly well equipped to be a pretty effective leader, if not a great leader. 
um, whatever the movement, whatever the mission, whatever the entity or or grouping um, that that you're leading. This is sometimes, of course, described as or referred to as you know leading from behind. Um, and I think that there's just an awful lot of wisdom in that. You know, there's, at least sort of what I would want to do if I were a leader. Yeah, there's definitely a lot in there that you said that resonates with me and what I believe leadership is. I <clears throat> really do believe actions speak louder than words. Yeah. We have career politicians right now that it seems like the only skill they know is how to get reelected. Yeah. And I don't really know if that's a skill that you want to have a leader in. Mm -hmm. uh, you maybe want to have a leader who's great at building out products or very great at empathizing with human beings. But people can be charismatic and trick other people all the time. Words mean yeah. nothing. Actions, watch their actions, not their words. Yeah. Um, I'm a big Elon Musk fanboy because of what he's done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is he perfect? No. Does he make a lot of stupid mistakes? Sure. Yeah. Any person would be, if you put him on a pedestal and you listen to every single thought that comes out of someone's mouth and they can send it out to hundreds of millions of people in a second. Uh, but Elon Musk said, and this was just his thought on leadership. And you actually said this too, was I didn't want to have to do what I had to do, but no one else was doing it. So I felt obliged to do it. Mm -hmm. And I do believe that thought that like great leaders don't like are the guys that are the loud guys in high school that are trying to be the alpha male or, you know, just trying to put on a show to mm -hmm. act like a leader mm -hmm. because there might be some benefit, social, whatever it have be, um, that are really the best leaders. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, there's so many points there that you laid out that I'm not going to reiterate because you did a great job of, of pointing them out. And I agree with so many of them. I really wanted to emphasize that point of empathy though. Mm -hmm. And really being empathetic, you can be strong, mm -hmm. but at mm -hmm. the same time, empathetic and mm -hmm. understand people that you're supposed to serve. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would even add that. I mean, I, I probably should have been a little clearer when I when I talked about the sort of the curiosity uh, elements uh, as, as one of the first. Um, I really should have emphasized that more. I, I, I can't thank you enough for, for bringing that into this too. Part of the curiosity, I think has to be a curiosity about how it's looking to somebody else, how it's all looking or what's being faced by. Um, and that is so important that it really, I think you're right, it deserves being drawn out separately as its own uh, characteristic, right? Sort of empathize, be able to be the other person or the other person in a certain sense um, and, and, and love them, right? I mean, this might even warrant separate, um, you know, sort of separate notice as well, even though you could, I suppose, fold it under curiosity or fold it under empathy, which you then fold under curiosity. But, but this is going to sound kind of corny and hippy dippy, but I really think love is, is critical here too. You really have to love um, those on whose behalves or with whom you are working, um, with whom you are collaborating, with whom you are in this together, right? Because we are, you know, basically any, if we, to talk leader is automatically to talk more than one person. Um, that means you're automatically talking about a we rather than just an I, and even rather than just a bunch of separate eyes, because the eyes are brought together by the mission that defines the, the, the grouping or the organization. And insofar as they're brought together by that, they actually become something more than separate eyes. They become a we. And you really have to love, I think, the, this we to be part of it. And you have to love every I that goes into constituting uh, this we. And part of that love, you know, sort of, it almost it kind of in a certain sense is that love, is that empathy, right? That sort of being the other people in addition to being yourself in a certain sense. And that's, you know, I think you're so right. It, it, uh, I should have I should have actually thought to mention that just you know separately. So you know, thank you, Jay, for that. That's exactly right. I think. I think one of the biggest things that faces a leader is limited resources and how to allocate that efficiently, mm -hmm. and that speaks volumes because you know everyone wants to be helped in mm -hmm. some regard, but you only have so many limited resources. How do you allocate that efficiently mm -hmm. without having uh, oh well this guy's 
playing favorites to this side or that side. Mm -hmm. And it's so hard because it seems the way it's structured in government is you need to get reelected. So you kind of have to play favorites to some degree. And that really hinders your ability to make uh, overwhelming change. Um, and yeah. I don't know a solution to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's um, <clears throat> kind of like like you, Jay. I, I sort of um, I think about that with some frequency, or I kind of contemplate it, and um, with a view, with a hope to sort of gleaning some kind of general lesson that might be um, sort of that then might serve as a kind of a protocol, or as a kind of a strategy, or as a way of being. Um, in order to sort of ensure that 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 leadership is is better leadership, and I, I don't know for sure whether I, I I haven't decided yet, or I'm just not sure yet whether I can generalize from the example I'm, I'm about to mention, but it might be that we can. So I'm going to offer it as at least a sort of a, a working hypothesis, even if it turns out not to be quite right. But <clears throat> as you know, one of the people um, I've worked for from time to time uh, is AOC. Uh, who I think is a great moral leader in this country right now. And people often talk about how she's mastered social media or she's a great communicator on a par with FDR. And that just as FDR mastered the then, uh, the modern medium of his time, radio with fireside chats, that she's mastered social media and she's she's energetic and charismatic and all that and, and all of that is is true but in a certain sense it kind of it, it's it's sort of like damning her with faint praise in a certain sense because what's most extraordinary about her i find and what i think accounts for her emergence as one of the nation's great moral leaders is precisely her moral seriousness and precisely her non-fixation on herself or on her entitlement to lead or on her greatness or suitability for the task of, of leading and of her having her eye on the actual ball or as they would have said during the civil rights movement of the 60s, her eyes on the prize. Um, you know, it all started, people sort of forget, it all started for her um, with the Keystone uh, pipeline uh, protests. and. She was among those who camped out on the reservation in the spot. And she regularly recounts having um, been hit by or struck with a, a kind of mystical experience at a particular moment. And it's sort of striking how, how this is sort of a recurring theme for many great leaders historically, right? There's the, the one in my own, the tradition that I was raised in, the one that's always the most conspicuous is Moses and the burning bush, right? So, you know, Moses is just kind of on his merry way, just being, you know, Moses, <laughs> just being a shepherd, you know? Uh, and then one day he's walking by a, a bush and it's, it's green, it's growing. It's not like a piece of dead wood. And it's on fire, um, but it's not being consumed. And and then a voice, you know, speaks to him out of it and says, you know, my people of whom you are one, um, you know, are enslaved. Um, and I really don't. That's not cool. That's not cool with me. I need somebody to you know lead them out of of, of this. And it just completely changed everything. It was just that that moment where he was just visited by the transcendent. And I was always struck, even the way it's even worded um, in the in the scripture is sort of it just blows you away, because you know Moses said, "Well, who the hell are you? You know what? Who should I say is you know who should I say sent me? If I'm if I'm going to my people saying I'm here to liberate you, you know who should I say told me? Should I say that a burning bush did? And right, and the voice, you know, and, and how is that going to help, right? Um, and the voice just says, "I am," you know, just says, "I am," uh, and then well, well all right, you are, right? But, but you know, what kind of clothes are you wearing? What color is your hair? You know, what, what are your hobbies? I am. And he just says, I am. Just tell him I am sent you, right? But, but you don't, it, it's, it's like, I, sometimes I'm riffing on the, the, the title of the great novel by the, the Austrian novelist of the turn of the last century, uh, Robert Musil, uh, The Man Without Qualities. Um, I sometimes call this the God Without Qualities. Um, the God Without Qualities is the, is, the, is the God, right? Because it's the one that just, it just is. But anyway, that experience, uh, that Moses uh, is recorded as having had um, is what sort of set him on his course in the, in the narrative 
and made him become what he was. And so he didn't then go to the Israelites or to the Pharaoh and say, hey, I'm Moses, you know, I'm really well educated, I'm strong and I'm creative. And so you really ought to listen to me. I got a very good brain. Um, he just sort of said, I am sent me and I'm here to, you know, get these people out of their chains, right? And there's a sense in which something like that, I think happened with AOC. I mean, she, she didn't like, uh, you know, come out of the wilderness and say, hey, I am has sent me. But she was set on her course by that, that the sort of transcendent experience. And what that means, or what that has come to mean, what that probably meant from the get-go, but has certainly uh, continued to mean or come to mean for, for her, it looks to me, is that that's what matters to her. And that's what she's going to do. And if she wins elections by staying that course, great. If she doesn't win elections by staying that course, then so be it. And she'll say that. She says that. Um, and she doesn't spend time fundraising. She spends all of her time doing the job, so to speak. Now, it might be said, well, yeah, she has the luxury of doing that in a way that some others might, because if I were, I don't know, let's say I'm like a 75-year-old uh, gray-haired man who has no particular mission and people have seen me sitting in the same seat in Congress for 30 years, so I'm kind of boring to them. Um, I might not have the luxury of saying, I have, you know, I have a moral vision and I'm going to pursue it and I'll take what comes, come what may. Um, maybe I feel like I have to, maybe, maybe in a certain sense, I do kind of have to fundraise to stay in office in a way that she doesn't precisely because she's so charismatic and all. But, but I, I think one can only go so far in trying to ground any argument on that distinction. I think my, my guess would be, and this is, this is where the uncertainty comes in. Remember, I, I sort of um, preface this by saying, I'm still not sure how much I can generalize from this, but I'm tempted to try to generalize at least partly from AOC's experience and say, you know, if you're, if you're motivated by what motivates her, if you're in this for the reasons that she's in this, you're not gonna have to spend nearly as much time as you think you are fundraising. You're not going to have to spend nearly as much time having, quote unquote, too many in mind. Um, you can actually focus on the, on the fight, on, the, on, the, on the, the sparring match, so to speak, with the samurai sticks. You can, you can do a lot more of that than you think you need to do. Um, and I, I, I think that's probably true. But I, I keep throwing in the weasel words probably because Again, it's, you know, I haven't tried it, for example. You know? yeah. um, so I, I, I just don't, I don't know. But it, it's, it's really tempting to think that's part of it. Another, another reason, just one last point, maybe in this connection, Jay, is that um, another reason to think that this might be at least somewhat generalizable is that there are some other leaders that share these characteristics with, with, with Alexandria to some extent, right? To, uh, at least to some extent. You know, notice a moment ago, I said, imagine I'm some gray haired uh, man in his 70s. Well, there is such a man, although he's actually white haired rather than uh, gray haired. His name is Bernie Sanders. <laughs> and he, too, has stuck on message constantly. You know, you, you know what drives him. It's been driving him ever since he got into scuffles with police in 1962 when protesting to try to racially integrate the dorms at the University of Chicago when he was an undergraduate there. And if you go back and find speeches that Bernie gave in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s, they're almost identical to the speeches he gives now. All the changes are certain numbers because the statistics are different. So a speech in 1984, <clears throat> he might say, you know, a nation of 180 million people, da, 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 da. And now the same speech will say, you know, a nation of 330 million people, da, 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 da. But the da, 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 da is all identical. Um, and some people might say, oh, man, he's a broken record. He's just always saying the same thing. But the, the, the key here is that that's, that's, that's what he believes in. That's what he's pursuing. That's what he's pushing. And that doesn't change to sort of suit different audiences. And so it's not like Bernie ever sort of changed his, 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 his sort of mission to sort of conform better to the times and, and thus finally became a national phenomenon because he finally fit in. It's sort of the other way around, right? I mean, the, the population caught up to him rather than his falling back to the population. Um, and so even if you're this sort of totally improbable 
uh, character as a, as a national phenomenon. Uh, a man in his mid-70s with, with white hair who just explicitly calls himself a socialist and comes from a state that isn't sort of representative of the country as a whole, and yet you just become this national phenomenon and then a kind of global phenomenon. Again, what's the secret? What does he share in common with um, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez? It's, it's not... It's not his age or his appearance or his hair color or his, you know, charisma. It's a very different kind of charisma if it's charisma. He's more like Larry David charisma if it's charisma. Uh, and it's actually almost anti-charisma. There's a kind of gruffness that's almost off-putting to people until they kind of get used to it and say, oh, yeah, that's our Bernie. But what it sort of shows you is as different as they are, sort of superficially speaking, they are deeply the same. Um, and both of them, I think, in consequence... Have become, have become hugely important leaders. And it's not without significance, going back to the ego point and the love point and the empathy point that you know, one of Bernie's slogans has always been, you know, not me, us, right? It's that we, it's not that I, and it's not even the separate eyes. It's the we that the eyes all constitute. So it's not me, us. And so I'm tempted to think, Jay, that this is generalizable, that if you really are actuated by the mission, that you kind of don't need to spend nearly as much time as you think you do trying to wheedle money out of people. Uh, people will just come to you. Um, but again, I, I keep saying probably because, you know, maybe I'm missing something here. I don't want to sort of be, I don't want to overstate the case, but it looks to me to be a pretty strong case. I agree. You made some great points. <clears throat> there is two other things that I wanted to add with my speculation on great leadership. Uh, one is suffering. Mm-hmm. And one is, ooh, I hate when this happens. It just slips out of my head. I'll go into suffering and hopefully the second point will come to me. Um, I think if you want to live a happy life, you don't think about problems. You live your life and you're ignorant to the world around you. And you can be in this silo of happiness and enjoy every moment and make your life the fullest. Mm -hmm. But I think the people that go out there and, and, and make great change, um, whether you look at that as good or bad, uh, have levels of suffering in their life because they want more. And when you want more, you're always going to be suffering more. If you're content with life, you're happy, you're satisfied, you don't need more. So why would you go out and do more? It's those people that are ambitious. If you look at somebody and I read something and I don't know if this is true or not, watch the way they eat. If someone eats really fast, they're probably more ambitious or more hungry. They're, they're unsatisfied. They just want to do things quickly as opposed to someone that sits there and slowly enjoys their meal mm -hmm. and takes their time. They're really cherishing every bite. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a little micro example of speaking to somebody's personality. But I think great leaders have this insatiable uh, level of suffering mm -hmm. in them constantly because they're unsatisfied. And I think to be a great leader, you give up a large part of who you are because you go to bed with those problems. You wake up with those problems. They're in the forefront of your mind. You can never really truly be satisfied or be in, in the moment because in the back of your head, you have that echoing, those people need me. You're so right, Jay. I think that's, I think, I mean, I think that's so right. And that's another, I mean, you're, there's something so deep about everything that every, every contribution you're making to this country, to this conversation is, is, um, almost like tear jerkingly deep for me. I mean, that's a really, it seems to me that's a really, really deep point. And it seems to me that it, it kind of hangs together um, uh, with the with the empathy point. Um, sorry, I've got to <laughs> get a choke up. Um, <laughs> it, it, it goes really deeply together with the empathy point and, and, and with the love point. Um, I, you know, I, I was talking with somebody who who means everything to me recently, and we were sort of uh sharing how when we were kids when we thought about um the the christian conception of heaven which was sort of part of our upbringings um how an oddity about both of us was that we always thought of of heaven as like well look i don't i don't need to go there until everybody else is there first in other words i I, I didn't, I didn't really want to, I didn't want to go there. I didn't think of it as a place like, oh, I, I want that. I need that. Instead, I thought of it as like, I, I thought I can't stand the thought of a world where they're, they're not all going to heaven. And I thought, 
I'll go too, but but not until everybody else is 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 there. If if you sort of thought in terms of like a sinking ship and lifeboats, um, there's a sort of this impulse to want to make sure everybody else is on a lifeboat before you yourself get on. And 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 it, it doesn't mean like you're a masochist. It's not like I would want or, or that my beloved either was a masochist where you would like want to go down with the ship. Um, it, you, you'd want to get into a lifeboat too, but the, the key point was that you wouldn't until everybody else was. And what that means is that you are then taking upon yourself the role of, anxi of being anxious, of having anxiety for just a little bit longer um, than everybody else, right? You want contentedness too. You want to be on the lifeboat as well. You want to get into heaven as well, but not until everybody else does. And what that means is that all of the, all of the anxiousness of non-satisfaction and of non-satiation is something that you yourself will at some point be able to get rid of too, if, if all goes according to plan, but you're not gonna be rid of that until everybody else is. And so you're gonna be like the last one to lose that anxiety. So what that means in turn then is that what you're, what you're doing is precisely what you just said so eloquently and, and so um, evocatively with just even a very homey example, like you go to bed with those things still on your mind uh, until they're not on anybody else's mind. And once they're not on anybody else's mind, then they can come off of, of, of your mind. And I think that is, that in a certain sense, that, that actually gives a kind of an additional metaphorical punch to this idea of leading from behind. Because in a sense, you are leading from behind if you're gonna be the last one on the lifeboat, right? Or if you're the last one into heaven or the last one to achieve nirvana, just like the Buddha wasn't going to, you know, didn't, you know, he wanted everybody else to achieve nirvana. It wasn't, it wasn't just for, um, if, you know, you, you, you are leading from behind in the sense that you're like, you're the last one who's going to get there. And it's actually, it's kind of interesting, isn't it? Now that I'm thinking of this, I never thought of this before. See, this is great conver conversations with, with thoughtful folk, like, like UJ had this way of like um, educating everybody and so certainly I'm being educated by this even by sort of seeing new ways of looking at stuff that's already in my head so now that I think of it um you know we, we I mentioned Moses and, and and Martin Luther King right Moses didn't get to the promised land right he got everybody else there but he didn't get to go and then of course that that unbelievably evocative final sermon that that uh, Martin Luther King uh, gave where he said I might not get there with you but we're going to the promised land and, and of course he, he didn't um, that's, I think, where that kind of, that continued suffering comes into it. Like the suffering of King is that he didn't get to go there with you, right? He was, he was going to be the last to cross. Uh, and Moses was going to be the last to cross. And in those two cases, because they waited for last, they didn't even get to go there, right? At least in this, in this life, in this world. Um, and the lifeboat, I suppose the lifeboat analogy would then be if you are, um, you know, trying to make sure everybody else gets in the lifeboat first, you might not even end up, you might end up going down, right? Um, but so you're, you're, in that sense, the suffering stays with you longest. Um, but again, you, you know, you can be comfortable, you can be confident that you're not being merely gratuitously masochistic um, simply by reminding yourself, yeah, I want to get into lifeboat too. It's just, it's not that I don't want the lifeboat. It's not that I don't want heaven. Um, it's just that I, I want to make sure everybody else is there first, um, and then I then I feel like I can do it. Um, a related final, a related point here, really, really quickly, uh, Jay, if I might, is that the other thing I think where suffering comes into this is that it comes into the, the empathy part of the story uh, that you emphasized before. Uh, thank heavens, um, since because I, I, I didn't even think to, to mention it separately. Um, a big part I think of what enables somebody to empathize, maybe, or maybe this is more chicken and egg, but. One thing that seems to enable people to empathize uh, better and more effectively is having suffered themselves at some point, because then maybe it's just a little bit easier for them, given our sort of cognitive limitations and our imaginative limitations, we might just be frail enough as a species that we're not as good at empathizing unless we ourselves to some extent have experienced precisely the experience that we're now trying to empathize with. My guess is that there are lots of moral heroes or saints who don't even have to have suffered directly in order to empathize, but there are other sort of maybe lesser saints or aspiring saints or would-be saints who are not quite as morally heroic, but are trying to be, who maybe empathize quite well, but only after having suffered themselves because then they can imagine it more easily. And 
that's another role I think played by suffering. And I think like, for example, it's, it's widely uh, observed that FDR um, before he was struck by polio could be kind of arrogant, was sort of cocky, self-confident because he was like this rich kid, right? He, he, was, he was pampered, he was, he was doted on by his mother. He was an only child and she treated him as the sort of king of the world, right? That nothing was too good for, actually nothing was good enough for her precious little Franklin, right? And, and you know, that affected him in his early uh, adulthood where he you know, sort of thought, well, yeah, naturally I'm entitled, you know, because I'm little Franklin, you know? Um, but, but once he was hit by polio uh, and brought down, laid low and threatened with the absolute end of his, of his political life, of course, but even of much more than his political life, um, it is widely observed that he underwent a kind of spiritual transformation and was able to sort of see through the eyes of folk whom he had never thought to try to see through the eyes of before, including the poor, the unemployed, the downtrodden, the homeless, the, the, uh, the dispossessed, the, the Okies, um, you know, in Steinbeck's novel, um, that he just became a, a more a full person in this way. And there's a sort of similar story in, in AOC's case. She was never born into privilege or anything even remotely um, you know, suggestive of privilege, but you know, she was she she basically had humble surroundings and circumstances from birth. But she had a very beautiful, loving family, uh, including her brother and and both and two parents, and was very close to her father. And her father died when she was still quite young. And that loss, um, it's it's hard not to think, and I think she herself will say. Um, played a really critical role in, in deepening her and enabling her to kind of know what it is to suffer the deepest kind of suffering of all. And I swear, you, if you, you watch her sometimes, if she's like listening to a constituent or talking to somebody, um, she'll sometimes begin to be kind of overwhelmed by, by tears. And you can tell that she wants to break down sobbing at, at some stories and it, it's, it takes all the strength and, and moral heroism of the world, much more than I possess, to sort of keep from, you know, kind of breaking down at the, at the sheer, you know, sort of sadness of it. And this is, again, um, you know, so it's suffering, empathy, egolessness, all go together in somebody like her. And I think that's why she's, you know, it, it's, it's hard not to think that that's so constitutive of her leaderly status of what makes her a leader, you know, mm -hmm. or what makes her deserving to be a leader um, as, as, as well. So I, th I, I think, think you're, overall. I think you're hitting the nail on the head because the only reason I brought up those extra points was because I have had a pretty hectic upbringing and I've seen a lot of pain and suffering. Yeah. So it really makes you reflect and look at life in a different perspective yeah. than I I thought everyone looked at life that way growing up, but yeah. the older you get, the more you realize, oh, people don't look at life like that because they haven't been through that. And then yeah. I see people diverge when people come from a chaotic upbringing mm -hmm. and they turn to substances to numb the pain. Mm -hmm. And some people get through that phase mm -hmm. or they go down a sunken hole yeah. or they go and they harness that anger and that pain and mm. do something constructive with it. Mm. And the only real concrete example I can talk about is Musk because he's impacted my life in many ways, just reading about him for years um, before he's as hyped up as he is at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, but from what I understand from his story, he suffered a lot of pain and suffering. Um, and I don't know his real motives, but the thing he will be remembered for mm -hmm. is shifting industries, shifting to an electric car industry he won't be remembered as maybe the best car maker in the world, mm -hmm. um, which I do think Tesla's are the best. I'm biased on that. But I will say with space, he probably won't be alive to see the colonization of Mars, mm -hmm. but he has created a shift. Mm -hmm. And that's what great leaders do is they create a starting point and hand the baton over to the next person. Mm -hmm. And it's always the hardest to get it started, to get that flywheel moving. But that's yeah. what he will be remembered for. Mm -hmm. He won't see it happen probably because we only have a limited amount of time on this planet. But I do think, and this is just my fundamental belief in life, is mm -hmm. we're all put on this earth to make people's lives better 
using mm-hmm. your own talents. And that's the hard part is figuring out what are you talented at and how can you use that to make people's lives better? Mm-hmm. And that's my purpose for life. So, 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 so deep again, Jay, I mean, I think that that seems exactly right to me. Um, maybe a, a few, a few observations in that connection that that sparks. Um, one is that while, while this kind of capacity to kind of empathize and to put yourself into the heads of others amounts to a kind of transcendence, a kind of independence of your own contextuality or independence of your own characteristics, a kind of I amness, just like the I amness of the God without qualities, as I called him or her in the in the burning bush there's a kind of similar transcendence of your of your own context and your own qualities and characteristics that is operative i think when you're empathizing when you're being the movement or being the mission that you are helping to lead um, from behind and when you are being a kind of um, avatar for or a representative of or a uh, an assistant to a group of people on the one hand um, I've always thought of that as being nicely captured by symbolically by the image of the third eye uh, in some of the Hindu representations uh, of, of, of the Godhead, that the third eye in a certain sense is the kind of the one from above that's sort of context independent. At the very same time, and let's call that just for want of a, uh, just because it's a convenient term, we can call that the sort of the transcendent piece of this or the transcendent angle or component. By the same token, it has always seemed to me that when we recognize this sort of transcendent aspect, there's a ri- we run a risk unless we're careful of then denigrating or downgrading or downplaying the significance of the imminent, of the here and now, of the characteristics, of the qualities, of the things that make you kind of who you are in your earthly existence, right? So that while I can say, Jay, you are much more than your embodied form. So you're not just a guy who has hair of a certain color, who's currently wearing a hoodie under a jean jacket, that you're more than that, that you're certain. I would also, in a certain sense, be, you know, devaluing you, I think, if I I didn't cherish you in these specific characteristics that you have, and, and if I didn't celebrate them and, and love them, right, love these individual characteristics, that, that, the, the, that the imminent in that sense is as sacred as the transcendent. And that like maximum sacredness, if I can sound like a CEO or a CFO or something for a moment, or like some, you know, somebody who's writing popular business books, like maximum uh, value or maximum, um, um, I guess like perfection comes in the wedding of this transcendent and this imminent together at the same time. I've always thought it significant that um, in the representations of the Godhead in the Hindu tradition that have the third eye, it's not like you poke out the first and second eye and then just replace them by the third eye. The first and second eye are still there. The third eye supplements them. It doesn't replace them. Um, and it's the, it's the unity of those together that is the miracle, right? That's the miracle of, of being human, it seems to me. And what you've just said, it seems to me, really nicely draws that out in a really kind of visceral and like empirically appreciable way, right? That, I so I too am sort of a am, am, am a Musk fanboy, and this actually you know this might kind of crack you up, but um, but I've actually been a, a, a kind of a celebrator of Musk and what he sort of stands for and what he is for years now, and a lot of my fellow lefty friends, because as you know, being associated with with Bernie and AOC as I am, as you can imagine, I'm sort of taken to be a lefty, and I have lots of lefty friends, but. I've never thought of myself as being merely a lefty, right? There's just, I'm, I, I just don't, I don't, I'm not like on some, but anyway, um, one of the things that makes it kind of clear that I'm not a kind of um, cliche lefty, at least, is I think Elon Musk is really quite cool. Um, and yeah, he's got flaws like all of us have. Um, and he's made, made some big mistakes and blunders in his life, as most of us have, certainly as I have. Um, but um he wouldn't be him, you know, if he were just the Musk without qualities, right? He's yeah. he's got his qualities. He is he was, and I think you're right. Like part of one way to think about the mission of our lives of, of is is to sort of say, well, look, each of us is put here for a reason. 
Uh, and each of us is situated, each of us is put in a particular place, a little, a, a particular piece of space time, as it were. Um, and there must be a reason for that, for, not only for being here in general, but for being here there and now, right, there and then. Um, and we don't want to devalue that either. And it does seem to be kind of like our mission to sort of do our bit to sort of, you know, each of us, you know, coming into everything from our own particular angles, all of it then converging on a beautiful point that combines all of the different angles from which people approach it. And that point is the sort of, you can almost think of it as the kind of the, um, you know, it's, it's the sort of, uh, Cartesian product or something of, you know, everything coming together. And in, in that sense, it's a dazzling and wonderful thing. Uh, maybe a, a sort of a, maybe a final point in that connection, I'm sort of tempted to make just a, even if only in passing, uh, Jay, is that it might even be that Elon will, will live to see it because, you know, one of the most interesting and fascinating uh, areas in which human knowledge seems to be suddenly developing really rapidly and that I kind of wish Elon himself or somebody similarly inclined and similarly resourced uh, maybe would, would take up as a sort of personal project is um, the science of cell uh, deterioration and cell reproduction and, and rejuvenation. Um, and as you probably know, you, maybe you're already following him, there's a, a doctor at the Harvard Medical School named David Sinclair, who's been doing a great deal of research in this area, basically sort of figuring out the mechanics pursuant to which um, cell division and cell recomposition or cell regeneration or self generation or self replacement uh, proceeds and sort of what prevents it from what prevents a new cell from being sort of genetically identical to its predecessor cell rather than just sort of slightly less intact and hence you know, with each iteration, you know, heading toward, you know, terminal deterioration. Um, and he seems to have kind of figured out a lot of the mechanism. And furthermore, he's kind of, he seems to have figured out not just as a sort of theoretical matter, but to some extent as a practical matter. He's conducted a number of experiments now um, with particular uh, chemicals that are designed to sort of slow down or even arrest or even reverse that process of the DNA strands kind of fraying at the edges and has actually, you know, basically he's had gr mice that have gone gray that had then gone backwards to brown again. And with, you know, uh, sort of deteriorating or atrophying muscles or muscle mass to restored youthful muscle mass. And then this is, this is this could sound kind of weirdly science fictional and even kind of ethically suspect, except that when you look at the details, it turns out not to be. But he then carried the experiment over to his own father, right? Because his father had been, you know, very robust and very um, energetic, a mountain climber, hiker sort of guy who, when he got, I think when he got into his 80s, began finally to kind of slow down. Uh, and Dr. Sinclair, you know, began to sort of treat his father with these concoctions that he was developing as well as himself. And his father sort of, in a sense, reversed back to being around more like in his 60s or late 50s or something rather than being in his 80s, functionally speaking, even mm -hmm. though not chronologically speaking. Um, so what it's looking like to me, what Sinclair says, he thinks that we're really very close now to lifespans of like 250 or more years and but and, and not just not lifespans of like 250 years where like the last 175 of those years are on life support or in a hospital or a nursing home but with the high quality of life and that that's almost true by definition because the very thing that enables the lifespan to extend to 250 is the slowing down of the aging process that itself causes deterioration of the quality of life in the first place. So in effect, you're extending life by slowing down the deterioration process, meaning that you can functionally be what we associate with being a 25 year old or 30 year old now with being a 140 year old maybe in the future, right? Not that far. And it's tempting for me to think then that really we're, we're in the midst of this really interesting critical period now, because I think if we can preserve if everybody who's alive now, if we can keep everybody who's alive now reasonably healthy and alive for another five to 10 years, then there's a real prospect that all of these people, whether they be 30 now or 80 now, can end up living another 200 years starting in you know 10 years from now or whatever, right? Now, maybe it's not 10, maybe it's 15, or maybe it's five, you know, I, we don't really know. But, but basically it looks like we're on the cusp of some massive um, developments there. 
uh, and being kind of almost, you know, metabolically optimistic as I tend to be, um, I'm very strongly inclined to think that um, Elon um, might well be with us for another 200 some odd years, uh, if not more. I hope so. And I hope all of us will be here that much longer. Um, the book by the, the uh, Sinclair has written tons of articles on this stuff, but there's a book you might've seen called Lifespan that sort of gives you the sort of summary account. I'll, I'll send you a link if you haven't already seen it. It's, it's kind of pretty cool, pretty interesting stuff. Yeah, definitely send that my way. I heard about him first on Joe Rogan's podcast. So I've listened to him about some anti-aging stuff. Mm -hmm. And to be 100% honest, I don't know how I feel about that. I haven't given it great thought. Mm -hmm. I think one of the best parts of life is death mm -hmm. because it's so freeing. And you know, you only have a limited time on this earth. Mm -hmm. So you better make every moment matter. Mm -hmm. And if you keep extending that, there's going to be unintentional consequences. One that jumps out to the forefront of my mind that why do I have to work so hard? I have a hundred, another hundred years to do something. And then you end up, you know, becoming stagnant and not doing anything. Mm -hmm. I think death and keeping that on the forefront of your mind and knowing that that could be around the corner any day mm -hmm. is such a powerful motivation and such a freeing mentality mm -hmm. for you to make change now mm -hmm. and iterate quickly um, another unintended consequence could be, uh, we would definitely need to move to another planet because we are running out of resources on earth based on the current population. And if they don't age out and die, not to sound harsh, but you're going to have younger generations come in and we're just going to be overpopulated. And it'll be interesting if we can genetically modify enough food and, uh, capture the carbon that's already being produced or, produce less of it. But if we can't do that in time, and we just have too many people on this earth, there's just so many unintended consequences that can come from aging. Now, if someone, I'll give Musk my ticket to live another 100 years, he can take that because I think he'll do a lot more with, with my 100 than maybe I would do. Um, <laughs> but I, I wanted to talk about this, this point. And I think there's, in my opinion, two of the biggest issues facing America and the world in this order, in my opinion, is inequality and, and uh, well, actually three inequality, but you could also tie education to that, but I'm going to give that as a whole second point and then climate change. Mm -hmm. I want to talk about that first part and you can obviously add education into that because I do that too, mm -hmm. but what are your thoughts on solving this issue of inequality? Because it's only getting larger as uh, the internet has centralized five companies as like the big dogs. And now everybody has to play within these people's rules. Mm -hmm. And you're seeing this wealth gap become even bigger and bigger. And if you see something like CRISPR technology that's coming around the corner, mm -hmm. who would have access to CRISPR to make designer babies first? Mm -hmm. Now, is designer babies a real possibility? Probably not. The technology is not there. But if it does hypothetically happen, who will have access to it first? The rich. So the rich will have that, that access and they will genetically modify already more advanced children, mm -hmm. therefore making the inequality gap even larger. Yeah. So I just, with the centralization that the internet has provided, how do you think about approaching this, this bigger and bigger problem of inequality because the attack on the Capitol might have been orchestrated by the former president. Mm -hmm. However, there is an underlying scary feeling that that didn't come from without the United States that came with from within. And mm -hmm. there's some deep seated anger and resentment down there. And it is boiling. And you just saw a flash of it. And there's a yeah. lot more to come, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. How do we attack this problem of inequality? And I'm just confused as why we're not all talking about it. Why? is this not a, a big conversation? I know it's not clickbaity, but this is a big issue that I'm just not hearing enough about. Yeah, no, another another great set of uh, queries and observations, Jay. Um, I think I can actually frame an answer that makes it sort of segue um, out of what we were talking about a moment ago when it comes to sort of life extension and the like. Um, so to start with, um, I originally, at least um, back when I was 20, I remember having exactly the same um, thought, or at least very similar thought to that, which you just articulated about sort of longevity. I thought, well, 
I really don't want to quote unquote, quote unquote live forever. Like, you know, what would I do even, you know, and, and, and like the meaning of life would change if the, if the sort of terminal point of life was sort of removed and, and life itself might become, might just, you know, so much of the significance of our lives has to do with finitude or is rooted in finitude, even if not all of that significance is, as, as I'm about to, to note. Um, but at the time, you know, it's funny, I thought so much of the significance of, of my life is, it does have to do with finitude so that maybe in a sense to get rid of mortality of that kind is to sort of get rid of significance and, and make life sort of flat and, and, and less rich and meaningful. And um, so I, I was very much, you, you know, sort of of your school of thought on, on that at that time. Um, two, two things I think sort of somewhat changed that for me. And, and the things that sort of changed that for me have to do with your sec the, the, the last question, right? The, the, the point that you just now made and the, and the query that you just now um, uh, offered. So the, the first is this, I thought, well, actually we wouldn't be dispensing with mortality. There would still be human fragility, right? You still can get run over by a truck. You still can be killed by a murderer. Um, you still might be killed by a policeman in a protest. Um, you still, you know, all sorts of horrible things could happen, right? And in that sense, the poignancy of mortality and the poignancy of finitude would be just as present. It's just that the focal point of that poignancy would now be in your vulnerability rather than in your being programmed to die, right? So that your automatic uh, expiration date piece would be taken out. But in a certain sense, it would almost highlight the attention then to the other sources of death, right? If you think about it, you can almost think of the, 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 the current inevitability of death as actually serving to kind of lower the intensity of the feeling of finitude and vulnerability because it's so easy for people to say, as they often do, well, everybody's going to die or, you know, you're, you're, you're going to die sometime. So, you know, so if, you know, so what if she got hit by a truck uh, and died at the age of 58 or something? I mean, she would have died at 88 anyway or whatever. Um, if you take away the automaticity or the kind of the inevitability, in a certain sense, it makes more salient the random, the random threats to your existence. And in a sense, it almost makes life feel to me even more precious because you kind of feel like, oh my God, you know, there's no reason for this to end, but some random thing could happen and make it end. And that's, that makes me feel at least a kind of a desperation to preserve people, not to like put them in ice or whatever and say, you know, like become a kind of overprotective mother or something or overprotective father and say, now, Jay, honey, don't go out. You might get hit by a car, you know, and sort of keep you protected. But it just, I think it would add to this kind of, you know, I remember the first time I ever was, you know, sort of in, I was sort of in love. This first time I really, really loved somebody who wasn't in, in my family. I remember, Anytime that she got on a bicycle to ride somewhere, suddenly feeling this horror, like, oh, what if she got hit by a car on that bicycle? And, and I thought, what a curious, morbid thought that is. Um, the funny thing is, I think I'd probably be thinking a thought like that all the time if people didn't have natural expiration dates, which might actually be a reason to keep automatic expiration dates, just so I won't go insane with worry. But <clears throat> but in any event, there's, there's that. But now note how this segues into uh, the matter of inequality, social... Uh, dysfunction, possible social unrest, deep-seated angers, um, and the like. I tend to think that once we're more mindful of the fragility of human life, even apart from the expiration date, um, there's a, a possibility at least, maybe I'm projecting too much here, but there seems a possibility at least of a greater appreciation than for the sacredness of, the sanctity of, the miracle of life, right? That in some ways it seems even more miraculous if it doesn't have an expiration date and can only be terminated by some ridiculous, meaningless, random event. Because the contrast between the meaninglessness of the car crash, let's say on the one hand, and the kind of the miracle of that human being on the other hand, somehow makes the, the miracle of the human being feel even more powerful and more awe-inspiring, that you, you feel almost worshipful toward it. Um, and that in turn makes me want even more to see to it that every human being has the material basis for a flourishing 
meaningful life, right? That's not a life of struggle, um, at least not of, of sort of like just deathly struggle. Uh, and that's not a life of hunger uh, or wondering where the next meal is going to come from or whatever. And assuming that I'm not unique, assuming that I'm just like everybody else, which surely I am, um, my guess would be that the, the capacity for that kind of feeling of stewardship for one another, uh, of responsibility for one another, might actually be heightened uh, in people um, if, if the focus was, was shifted to immediate threats to existence rather and, and away from the, well, we're all going to die anyway, so who cares? Um, you know, that kind of thing. Now, all of that being said, uh, the last thing in the world I could ever do in good conscience is suggested, I think that would just sort of happen automatically. Um, and that takes us then to the question of policy, like what should we be doing as a people, as a society, as a great big we, a global we on the one hand and a national we uh, on the other hand, um, to, uh, to sort of um, optimize our chances of, of putting in place a world of this kind. In other words, to get to the more specific pieces of your question, what do we do to preserve the planet? What do we do to colonize other places to avoid running out of resources here? What do we do to address inequality directly, even assuming that we get people to agree that inequality is a problem, which happily more people now are agreeing than would have done 10 years ago. What do we do about it? Well, I think there are a few things that we can sort of say there, uh, Jay, at least tentatively at this particular juncture. Um, <clears throat> one is that the just as the sort of technology of, of human life preservation and extension is, is advancing, so does the technology of recycling, not in the kind of, oh, put stuff in the recycling bin, but in a much broader, deeper sense of recycling seem to be advancing. In other words, the reuse of just basic physical building blocks, the reuse of atoms, <laughs> I would say, just the reuse of atoms that have already been used in one way um, is becoming an ever more proximate prospect, right? Um, it's amazing how much more we're figuring out how to do when it comes to this. And so assuming that progress, intellectual progress and then practical progress associated with it along these lines continues at its present pace or maybe even accelerates, um, I think that the carrying capacity as the environmental scientists call it of the earth is itself going to grow enormously relative to what it is now. At the same time, the technology and the wherewithal for colonizing other places in the solar system is developing too, not at the same pace, but at a pretty ra a rapid clip. And we can thank Mr. Musk in part, along with many others for that too, right? But that's happening. So that it could be that what we're looking at, the, the optimistic scenario might be that um, in, the, um, in the short to medium term, <clears throat> we grow the carrying capacity, carrying capacity of the earth enormously to the point where once the population grows to where it is pushing up against even that expanded carrying capacity that, you know, sort of by that point, we've developed the technology of, of interplanetary colonization to where we can then move to other planets as well. And it won't be an exotic prospect. It won't it won't seem formidable. There won't be like all these like, you know, we won't visualize lots of contraptions with lots of hoses and pipes and balloon suits that people are dressed in. It'll be sleek and streamlined, just like a Tesla. Um, like that, is, is, is it the 300 or the 3000? That's the kind of standard model. Is it the three? Uh, the, the three, the model the three, three. The model yeah. three. Yeah, so the, the, you can imagine, you know, that not that long from now, maybe when we visualize space colonies, we visualize something along the lines of the Model 3 rather than something like steampunk art, you know, with lots of, you know, sort of pulleys and ropes and, and, and cog wheels and sprockets and the like. Um, but, but that's, again, maybe the sort of airy-fairy pie-in-the-sky, you know, ridiculously sanguine um, scenario. But it seems to me that that's, a, that that's a realistic prospect, that we sort of, we could do that. Um, now, finally, back to the inequality matter, that only happens, it seems to me, if we do uh, do something about the inequitable distribution of material opportunity um, over the world's population 
and over the nation's population, right? That one way to think about this is that, you know, part of what we are as human beings is creative. We're, we're makers sort of by nature, you know, to, you know, kind of borrow uh, some terminology from a, an unfortunate uh, right-wing trope about makers and takers. Um, I actually think we're all born makers. I think we, you know, if, insofar as we have, you know, basic natures, and to some extent we have, it seems, um, it seems to be really deeply coded into our, our genome to be makers, to be, we're, we're creative. We, we imagine things and we produce things on the basis of those imaginings. But some of us have more opportunity to realize those visions and to do that creating than others have. Some of us are in a sense in a foxhole or in a trench with bullets flying overhead. And we have to worry so much about not being shot or you know not going hungry that the, the maker in us has to be sort of suppressed or sort of told to you know wait wait until later, wait your turn, wait until we're not dodging bullets here anymore. Um, and the, the key then, the sort of one of the key social goals that I think is, that confronts us is how do we get everybody out of the trench? How do we get everybody out of the foxhole? How do we get it to where nobody's having to dodge bullets anymore so that the, the, the maker that is in everybody can sort of then come out and sort of fully flourish? Now, there are various ways to do that. Um, one way is yet another realm in which Mr. Musk is something of a pioneer, um, or at least is allied with pioneers. Um, and that's, of course, the UBI movement. Um, whether you go for UBI or you go for something a little different from UBI, there's a common thread, and that is the way I think of it, is one way to kind of characterize it in sufficiently generic terms as to cover all the different options that seem to be on offer, in addition to options that aren't yet on offer, but that I think will be on offer. I've got a book coming out on some of those, um, is to <clears throat> think of it as material opportunity, uh, basic resources, the, 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 the inputs, you might say, that the makers need to do their making. Um, and what are some of those inputs? Well, one is nutrition, right? You know, you have to be fed um, and, and water, right? Those sorts of basic things. Other is like just basic educational uh, inputs. Some of that is a matter of access to institutions that exist out there that have campuses and professors and classrooms or what have you. But some of it also is just access to the web that has podcasts like yours on it, which is another you know critical resource that's out there but that some people can't access even though it's freely available on the web because they don't have broadband let's say if you're out in appalachia for example um so you know and then some of it is just sort of working capital you might say to sort of the initial capital to start up a business at least if we live in a, in a if we have an economy that involves a significant element of private ordering where people can start businesses um, rather than the state doing all the producing and the, and the distributing. Um, if we have a privately or at least partly privately ordered economy, as we probably always will, um, then there has to be some way for people to access sort of working capital to sort of, or startup capital, we could call it, to kind of get things going and get things started. And um, some of that is publicly done. It's obviously not going to be all publicly done, but um, but you know, you know, some people. This is sort of a this is a, something I always love um, informing people of. You know, you've heard people say when they're sort of denouncing the idea that we as a society might, through our federal government, um, devote more public resources to research and development and to sort of starting up new companies and stuff. Um, the the trope that'll be trotted out by a Tucker Carlson or something will be Solyndra. What about Solyndra? But what they always leave out is Tesla. <laughs> Tesla actually received public financing, as did Solyndra, and pursuant to the very same program. And the mistake, the mistake that's made by the people who sort of cry Solyndra and wave the bloody shirt of Solyndra is they look at specific companies rather than portfolios of projects. And so now I'm going to do a little bit of finance wonkery here. And financiers, not that I can possibly condone every single thing that financiers do or say, um, but one thing that financiers typically do that I think is the right thing to do is oftentimes they'll think not in terms only of particular projects or particular companies that are pursuing projects, but again, of clusters or packages or projects, portfolios, again, is what we'll call them of projects. And the way to look at Solyndra is to look at it as having been part of a portfolio, another element of which was Tesla. 
And, um, and then what, what the financier is going to do is ask, how did the portfolio perform as a whole? Because the understanding is some stuff's going to fail, right? Nothing ventured, nothing gained, as the saying goes, right? You don't succeed if you don't take the risk of failure. Um, and one way that you can sort of have it both ways, one way that you can optimize the likelihood of success and minimize not failure, not the likelihood of failure, but the magnitude of failure is by diversification. And you diversify by assembling a portfolio of multiple projects. So that, that way, if one or two of them fail, it's okay as long as the rest of them perform well. And if you construct the portfolio well, that's what's going to happen. And there's a whole discipline in the academy that's devoted to that. We call it portfolio theory, right? Now, Basically, the program, the Obama-Biden era program, pursuant to which Solyndra received some public funding, was a program pursuant to which Tesla also received some funding. And basically, you had kind of garden variety portfolio theory engaged in by the designers of the program that did that. And I think, I think you and I would probably both agree that the success, the spectacular success, the seemingly almost unprecedented success of Tesla, much, you know, just infinitely outweighs the, the, the sort of blip-sized failure of Solyndra. Solyndra was just the loss leader, you might say, right? But every portfolio has loss leaders in it, right? But, but Tesla is now the most heavily capitalized company in the world. It's the biggest bloody company in the world. And like five years ago, it was like a gleam in an eye, you know? 10 years ago, it was even less than a gleam in an eye. And so I'm thinking that, you know, this sort of takes us in a way to the phase two stuff too, or at least it implicates the phase two stuff that, that will be the next stage in the kind of first hundred days of the Biden administration. A big part of phase two is about how to regularize or institutionalize and expand, scale up basically, the humble effort at portfolio construction that was sort of pioneered in the very late Obama years to sort of get venture capital to the future Teslas and that too, I think, is a part of doing that material resourcing of one another in our maker capacity so that we can all sort of flourish. Now, finally, a final point in this connection, uh, Jay, is, <clears throat> and actually in a, in a really interesting way, it both flows right out of this last observation on the one hand and takes us full circle to the matter of life extension or longevity on the other is, is this. This is really, it's kind of cool and kind of mind blowing so remember I mentioned that when I was about 20, my worry about life extension or the idea of not having a death or an expiration date written into the gene code or genetic code was that, well, maybe life would seem, you know, kind of meaningless or something if there was no termination, if it could just go on and on forever. There's a, there's a, there's a, a term for this, a Latin term that people sometimes use for this. They call it horror vacui, right? The kind of fear or the dread of a vacuum, the kind of the, the vast emptiness that comes with infinitude, in this case, infinitude of life is scary. Like, oh, holy crap, what do, I, what do I do with myself under such circumstances? Well, a very similar question, but in a slightly different realm, uh, was entertained uh, in the 20th century. I think it was 19, maybe 35 or so. Uh, maybe it was earlier 30s. Um, by probably the greatest Anglo-American economist of the 20th century, and that was uh, J.M. Keynes, John Maynard Keynes. And while everybody talks about his general theory, um, which sort of established in a way the whole discipline of macroeconomics, um, and you know, a fair number of people also will speak of his treatise on money, which was an, a really important contribution to our understanding of how money works and monetary economics about six, six, <clears throat> six years before the general theory. <clears throat> he also was a very creative, sort of fanciful, imaginative thinker. And he would sometimes allow himself to kind of sit back and indulge sort of flights of fancy in that kind of creative way that you and I were talking about earlier in this conversation about how a great leader is somebody who can you know, kind of creatively visualize or imagine or think or um, is who's sort of inquisitive and curious and then can sort of uh, imagine solutions or spot possible solutions to problems. Uh, Keynes did this a lot too. He had a very, very, um, how should I put it, a very rich um, imagination and a very well-developed imaginative capacity. So he sort of sat back in the armchair as it were one day and sort of wondered, 
what would the world look like if we got to a, a condition of what we might call post-scarcity, where basically our productive capacities had finally grown to the point where material satiation was a possibility, right? Um, because what he asked himself first is he sort of, he said something like a, kind of realistic in the same way that I think it's kind of wrong for us to assume that we're all naturally uncreative or we're both, or we're all naturally dull and stupid and need somebody to lead us or push us or whatever, or that we're all basically naturally inclined to steal from one another and not and, and cheat rather than actually be good and, and be creative and be loving and caring and empathetic. In the same way that it would be a mistake to think the dark side is the side here. Keynes, I think, recognized that it's also a mistake to think that our material wants are completely insatiable. In other words, like, you know, if you've eaten 10 bags of potato chips today, you probably just don't even want an 11th bag. In fact, you probably lost interest after the first one tenth of the first bag, you know? Uh, and if you've eaten anything more than that, it's because they put chemicals in it to make your body want to keep eating it, even though your stomach is getting all full and you're really going to probably throw up later. Um, but we don't, you know, basically the thought was, you know, we actually, it's now productive capacity was growing so rapidly in Keynes's day that he thought it's now not out of the realm of imagination to imagine a world in which our basic material wants are satisfiable as long as we arrange production in the right way so that then what remains is our sort of spiritual wants or our sort of artistic or creative wants that the basic physical the animal needs are satisfied um and here's here's what was sort of interesting about the, the upshot of this kind of thought experiment that he performed he, he wrote it up by the way in a piece i'll send you this too as a link um, it was called economic possibilities for our grandchildren so keynes was basically imagining we'll probably reach that point at the time that he would have grandchildren who were grown up which would have been about now <laughs> so um <clears throat> but in any event he thought there are a couple of things we got to think about uh, in, in, in view of the likelihood of this circumstances coming to pass. The first is that so much of our sensibility and so much of our culture and so much of our habits of thought and habits of acting and habits of being are predicated on scarcity and are predicated on the struggle for material existence that if we're suddenly, if we suddenly have everything that we need materially, the first thing that's likely to happen is everybody's gonna just freak the fuck out, pardon, pardon the expression. Like everybody's just gonna think, holy crap, what do I do with myself? What do I do now? Sort of in the way that I sort of thought with horror when I was 20, if I were told you can live forever now, holy crap, what do I do with all of this time? Or if time is a resource, then you can sort of generalize from that horror that I experienced, that form of horror vacui that I experienced at the age of 20 to this as well and sort of say, well, look here too, it's like, well, if I don't have to struggle to exist, if I don't have to struggle even to eat, then what the, you know, WTF, what are, and, and he said, you know, this is going to, this is going to confront us with a kind of cultural existential crisis because everybody's going to be thinking, what now, you know, and so we better start thinking now uh, in advance before we get to that point, what we want to do, how, what kind of culture we want to establish or sort of gradually build so that we kind of know the answer to that question. We sort of know what to do once we reach that point. So that's the first thing. Um, and then the second thing is we, again, there's the whole, there's the big if, like he's saying, okay, we will have the material capacity to be materially sated. But remember there was an if that I threw in there, a proviso. And that was, you know, provided that we can arrange it right, you know, <clears throat> so that all of this abundance isn't going to three people. So it's not just, you know, Elon and Bill Gates and um, you know Warren Buffett or something you know who who have it all that and and that's where this 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 proper distribution of what I was calling material opportunity before comes into the story. So what this leads me to ultimately, then Jay is I'm, I'm thinking that what we really need to do and what we're probably going to do because I'm, again I'm optimistic so I have to say that um, <clears throat> is we're probably going to arrive at sort of we're, we're groping toward and I think we're ultimately going to find a way of arranging access to the material inputs to production such that everybody has that access so that everybody can produce and when we figure that out what that's going to do is two really cool things first is it's going to bring that abundance that Keynes was imagining happening 
it's going to bring that kind of material non-scarcity, at least where basic needs are concerned. And it's also going to ensure that the distribution of all of that production is itself more equitable because the way we currently arrange things, your claim on the national product tracks what you've contributed to it, right? And the, the unfairness of the injustice of the present time isn't so much that your claim tracks your, your, your con contribution, it's the injustice actually resides in the unequal distribution of access to the material stuff that you need to work on in order to make that contribution, right? Another way to think about this, I sometimes call this the ethically exogenous resource stock. If I want to sound, you know, economistic um, when I'm talking, I'll, I'll put it that way. I'll say, you know, it's like anything in your life, Jay, um, like you can sort of roughly divide, you know, of all the stuff that you have or own or possess or have access to or whatever, you can kind of roughly divide between the stuff that you're responsible for in the sense that you brought it into existence, like this program that you do this is your creation you've done this and so this is ethically endogenous right you it is internal to you you've made or you are internal to it you've made it what it is um, but then the other component is what i call the ethically exogenous component it's the stuff that you aren't responsible for the existence of like so somebody invented the microphone technology that you're using right now and, and I, I i'm thinking that that you didn't um and you can correct me if i'm wrong but it looks like that's a microphone that was already invented by somebody um and so in a certain sense you're a beneficiary of what somebody else did um in that microphone and that's sort of true of all of us now right like all of us there's a huge a huge chunk of the wealth that makes up the world is attributable partly to, to God or the creator or whoever put the resources there, right? Just the material stuff, the, the precious metals, the petroleum or the, the, um, the, the silicon that we use to sort of capture sun rays and a renewable photovoltaic cell or whatever. Um, other, another piece of it is the legacy of earlier inventors that left us with this stuff and nobody has more claim than anybody else to it because those people are gone now and maybe even their descendants have sort of you know the the, the sort of we can't even track or trace the descendants of those people even assuming that they would have had a, pro a proper claim anyway um so there's that uh and then finally there's this there's our own contribution the labor of our own selves that we mix with this material substrate some of which is the legacy of other people who came before us and some of which is the gift of God or the, the endowment of the earth itself. And my thought is that one way to sort of think about this all kind of roughly is to say, all of us kind of have an equal moral claim on the ethically exogenous stuff, right? That the legacy of those who came before us on the one hand, including the knowledge legacy, that the sort of just the knowledge, just the, the sort of you know, kind of intellectual capital, I hate that term, but if, if we're gonna speak, you know, kind of financialistically, um, you know, we have a sort of an equal claim on that stuff, it seems to me, and we have an equal claim on the physical resource stuff as well. The only thing we have differential claims on is our own contributions, what we're sort of creditable with having done. And if we were actually to, to get serious about trying to equalize or at least approach something closer to equity, in the distribution of that input stock, that, that eth the ethically exogenous stock, A, there would just be tons more equality, period. And B, there'd be tons more production and productive activity. Because another way to think of the way we're doing things now is there's just this enormous waste because like, you know, 90% of the world's population, if not more, are natural makers who are not being allowed to make. Imagine what would be what would be being made right now. Um, what would be being invented? Imagine how many Elon Musk's right now, or potential Elon Musk's right now, are starving to death in you know maybe in Burma, uh, or maybe in Sri Lanka, maybe in um, somewhere in Central Africa or somewhere in Appalachia here in the U.S. Right? Um, and and it's and it's it's not because they don't have it's not because they're not makers or inventive. It's because they don't have those material inputs. So I'm really thinking, again, I don't want to sound you know, too wacky uh, optimistic here, but I, I really just am this optimistic. Um, in other words, I'm not, I'm not just sort of spinning wheels. I really believe this, um, partly on the basis of, of research and stuff too. It's not just like wishful thinking, I don't think. Um, we, we have the capacity to eliminate scarcity, even of human lifespan, right? We have, we, we're going to have the capacity to extend our lives, to have more time to live and to have more time to create and to produce 
and the the wealth that's going to come of that not money wealth necessarily or not, not necessarily money value wealth but just the material wealth and spiritual wealth and cultural wealth that's going to come when we get there is just it's just almost literally unimaginable at this point because it's so beyond what we're allowing ourselves to do at this point but it all is entirely contingent i think on our addressing precisely that question that you raised which is the inequality question and, and this is one reason I tend to think that the way to address that question is to sort of focus on inputs and say, there are material inputs to all of our making when we make. And most of those material inputs do not properly belong to anybody. They're legacies of the past and of the earth itself. And if we just equalize more or just, you know, we can't, obviously it's, it would be, it would be, it'd be hugely over prideful of our own intellectual capacity to think that we could somehow get it exactly right equally. But if we just made it much more equal than it is, if we just tr strove to sort of make that a more equitable distribution, I think that is to solve the inequality problem. And it's also to provide the abundance. And I have a funny feeling that when we get there and when we're doing that, Keynes's worry of, oh, then we're suddenly gonna think, oh, what, what the hell will we do now? is gonna just wither away or disappear in the same way that my worry, like what am I gonna do with my life if it's long lengthened that I had in my twenties um, is has disappeared now. I know what I'm gonna do with my life if I get to live to be 250 or 300 and I really want it. And it's not because I'm afraid of death or whatever. It's that there's just so fucking much that I wanna do. You know what I mean? And there's just yeah. so much stuff I wanna learn and to read. Um, just like infinitely, just totally insatiable about like wanting to learn more stuff. And I'm thinking it really pisses me off um, the thought that I might just have to stop learning because, oh, time for you to die. You know, I just want to you know, keep doing that stuff. Right. Plus, there's just a lot of love that you want to give. Right. I mean, I, you, I want to love forever. Right. And um, you don't want love to be shut off any more than you want the power to be shut off. Right. And um, if, if you die, the love in a certain sense gets shut off. And I want to keep that. Right. So I think I, I think that the the horror vacui problem, maybe to put it that way. I think that's going to take care of itself um, if we just focus on getting the capacity. Um, and the capacity here is an arrangement capacity, a, a social arrangements, basically the, the distribution of those, of access to those inputs, I think is the key here. There's so many <clears throat> thoughtful thoughts you had in that. Um, one thing I want to echo is that learn and be curious mentality that you said. Um, and, and in, putting that in the equation of solving inequality, that for me seems like the most simple, basic, efficient way to address that issue. And the internet with its negatives comes all the positives. And you as a person have the discipline to look at that, see and look at it like food. What is junk food? What is good food? And then from there, take that good food and learn something and be curious. And like you said, spend your whole life learning things and applying them and making people's lives better. You can never get bored. And I think a lot of people I've at least caught from my generation tend to get bored and tend to get stuck in their head and become stagnant. And there's so much to learn. You got to keep that flame going. And I think education has dumbed people down in terms of that curiosity to keep going. Maybe it's overwhelmed that at too much of a young age. Maybe it hasn't stimulated the right type of education. But I think the internet has kind of changed things on its head. And COVID has kind of emphasized that in terms of higher education mm -hmm. and maybe even lower education in terms of being able to access resources that you are currently interested in mm -hmm. instead of having to do a curriculum stated by the state. Mm -hmm. um, that might not be best for everybody, this cookie cutter approach. It might be able to attack a huge problem as efficiently as that was structured when it was first invented, but that needs to be refractored <clears throat> upon. And people now have the resources to go and look through YouTube and have this extensive library and learn things in a visual medium or mm -hmm. listen to Audible to hear it if they have dyslexia mm -hmm. or read books as it's historically been done. But mm -hmm. there's so many different options. You just have to have the discipline to find what you're interested in and just pursue that. And then mm -hmm. it's like a tree. Branches will come off of that and you'll never be bored. You'll learn something new. And the more educated you are, the more informed you are, the more you can be more comfortable in your own shoes and make better decisions for your life. Mm -hmm. You know, I think giving people, and I think you did mention this, um, 
equity is so important. You talked about portfolio theory, and I think uh, GameStop emphasized a real um, need in the marketplace for fit for fiscal education, mm-hmm. for financial. Uh, what are the words I'm looking for? Financial literature <laughs> that needs to be taught mm-hmm. at a younger age, or, or people need this, and it, it's very important because you know you can work all your life and still be poor. Mm-hmm. But if you invest well and you learn these fundamental skills that other people have just had access through, through word of mouth or being in a more an affluent area, mm-hmm. they've had a competitive advantage that's now being democratized through Robin Hood and through the mm-hmm. internet. Mm-hmm. And that's going to empower people to live better lives, in mm-hmm. my humble opinion. Yeah. So I, uh, I completely, I mean, I, I'm completely with you on that. I think that, um, there's like so many amazing things sort of underway right now. So many amazing things that are kind of happening um, when it comes to sort of how, not only sort of how we live, but how we produce and how we um, create and how we make and how we add value. And a part of that, both from the point of view of the sort of circumstances that give us the inputs to productive or creative or making activity, but also just in just in its own right, because it's just part of growing as a human being, is the way in which we access knowledge, uh, the way in which we share knowledge, the way in which we contribute to knowledge, the way in which we jointly generate knowledge. Um, there's 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 so many revolutionary developments here that are kind of in a way um, almost like kind of coming to fruition at the same time in these kind of mutually complementary ways. And part of that story, I think, a really big, huge part of it, of course, is, is um, access to things uh, via the internet. Um, also just the emergence and development and proliferation of new media of learning and sharing and communicating, like podcasts, for example, like Audible books, um, like YouTube videos that are sort of educational. Um, there's so many different ways in which people are sort of able to kind of share their own makings or their own discoveries with each other. And in a way, I mean, I guess one way to sort of think about it, this is a sort of a fairly prosaic and kind of, you know, kind of cheap way, but it still seems halfway evocative is that, you know, it's often said that what makes the human brain so remarkable, it's, it's not just the particular cells, but it's the synapses that connect the cells, right? It's the, or the, the neurological connections between the cells and the sort of the communications network as it well, the, the, as it were, the networking of the, of the parts of the brain um, is sort of what makes it what it is, or is quite as miraculous as it is, or at least is just as, if not more salient than, you know, the, the sort of constitutive elements. And um, you could sort of think that one way to, you know, one, one way of looking at the way communications and education and sharing have, have been evolving uh, over the last few decades is just, they're just more neural connections now by far, right? There are more neurons or more sort of individual cells too, um, particularly as more and more people have been able to gain access to these media. Um, but there are also just more interconnections. Um, and the more of that that happens, the, the more sort of intense the, the neural network as it were, the more generative it is. And I think there's probably even some law, like a, some kind of a counterpart to Moore's law or something that, that you know, sort of basically uh, quantifies the phenomenon as one that it's a kind of a growth phenomenon where the growth is sort of exponential. It's kind of, uh, um, you know, it accelerates, um, uh, hence, you know, exponentially. Um, and it, it, it opens the door to all sorts of other things too. Like, so for example, um, you know, somebody like the great creators of some of the industries that we currently sort of rest a lot of our, our lives on themselves, you know, sort of famously left uh, higher education institutions even quite early on. Um, Bill Gates is in some ways a, a, an odd example because he's not exactly an inventor, but he's a sort of transformative figure at least. And you know, he, of course, famously left uh, Harvard, I think, after his freshman year or whatever. And, and this is the story of so many, right? Um, and, um, and in a way, it kind of further strengthens, I think, this point, uh, or at least the, it makes it even more compelling, this observation that what we got to do is figure out a way of making sure that these basic material inputs to creation, to making, to productive activity, 
get spread much more widely because the the opportunities to make stuff out of those inputs are much greater too. Um, economists will sometimes speak in the language of opportunity costs, right? They'll say that it's just, it, you know, it's not only costly, you know, it's not only the case that we experience costs when we lose something or have to pay something or have to sacrifice something that we already have in order to, you know, gain or get something that we want and don't have, but that in a certain sense, it's also a cost if you're foregoing having one thing in order to have another thing, right? And, um, and opportunity costs then are sort of costs too, right? They're real costs. And you could say that we are incurring, you know, using that language, using that idiom, um, you could say that we are voluntarily incurring just an incalculably massive opportunity cost right now by foregoing all of the magic, all of the creation uh, that everybody is capable of both jointly and severally as teams, as groups, as interacting individuals, and even as just you know, lone individuals when somebody, you know, in a moment of, after a period of intense lonely reflection invents something really cool, you know, gets an insight that couldn't have been had if this person had been in conversations all the time, but it just took some sort of intense reflection or meditation. Um, and, and, and while that would be true under any circumstance, that would, in other words, it would have been a huge opportunity cost in 1950 um, as it is now, it's even more huge now precisely because more can be done with that, right? These, the new media that you referenced, um, the new modes of sharing and learning and collaborating make for much greater productive potential than we, that we, than we previously had. And that means in turn that if we don't exploit that potential, if we don't use it, we're losing even more, right? The, the opportunity cost is even higher. So there's a kind of a paradox here that by enriching our productive capacities in the way that we are right now with new media, we are impoverishing ourselves all the more as well in the sense that the opportunity cost that we now face is made bigger by that if we're not actually exploiting those new mechanisms, those new modes. And we're not if there's like some miracle of a human creature somewhere in Appalachia who could have invented who knows what in collaboration with others or individually, but simply will never have that sparked in the mind because she doesn't have broadband access or she's starving or she's having to fight just to stay alive or she's having to deal with a substance addiction either on her own part or on the part of a loved one because of the, the sort of demoralizing conditions in which she lives and her story is the story seemingly of maybe six some odd billion of the world's seven some odd billion inhabitants she's only one of them and she herself is an infinite miracle so imagine you know six billion um infinite miracles like this who are just stranded in a sense they're like they're like brain cells that are like kept off the network they're not allowed to be connected to the others so um i think you're you're so right it's like what what you were just saying is like so beautiful and so hope inspiring and at the same time, so sort of tragedy underscoring, you know, tragedy highlighting as well, because until we actually exploit these opportunities or sort of use them or, or, or I'm looking for some less, you know, businessy sounding term for this, you know, until we're levering them or, you know, capitalizing on them. I mean, everything sounds like a business term in this context, unfortunately, it sort of tells you something, I guess, about our culture. But, um, but in any event, you, you know where I'm going with that. Yeah. Um... I want to, and I, I really like doing this recently with all my podcast guests, is, is ending on this note. And I, I think you would really like this too. Um, if you're okay with this, what mm -hmm. are you most grateful for? Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm, first of all, that is, I'm, I'm, I'm tempted, except that it would sound like a gimmick to say I'm most grateful for that very question, <laughs> because um, it would only be a slight under, overstatement, right? I'm very, very grateful for that question. It's a wonderful, thank you for that. <laughs> thank you, Jay, for that. Um, <clears throat> um, uh, leaving to one side the question itself. So what, what was I most grateful for before you asked? <laughs> I'll, put it, I'll put, it, put it that way. Um, <clears throat> there are a lot of things. Um, but I'm going to say, I'm going to go ahead and name one because one really stands out. Um, 
more than anything else. And that is the, the complete and utter love of another, um, the complete joinder of, of, of souls with another where you make yourselves through one another in a sense, right? Where you each become more fully one or who you, each of you is by more fully becoming who you are as a we. Um, and I say that for a, a, a couple of, of reasons. Um, most of the reasons connecting up with, uh, with things, uh, believe it or not, that we've already talked about. Um, <clears throat> one is I think that it's the most, it's the most sort of transformative and, 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 and far reaching material foundation as it were, although it's not just a material foundation, so it's like a spiritual foundation, but it's an embodied spiritual foundation. So in that sense, it's a material one um, of all, right? That it makes everything else possible. It, it capacitates you, it empowers you to use that term, it strengthens you, it enables you to be visionary, forward-looking, and in a sense leading without being fixated on yourself and hence without mucking up your own path-breaking with self-consciousness or arrogation to yourself of something you know important. And so, so it's partly that. It enables you not to be ego-fixated while at the same time being really focused and, and directed and, 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 and determined and forging ahead with just just unshakable resolve. Um, it just makes it so much easier to be that person. It, 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 it's, it's like, basically, I don't think I could be a person like that if, if I were just me, right? Um, uh, and partly because you sort of have to be more than you in order to be you, I think. Um, this is, I mean, it's probably a weird way of saying it, but it, that's how, it, that feels like the right way to say it. You have to be more than you to be you. And the easiest way to be more than you is to be, really just so deeply and intimately connected with another that that you in a certain sense are that other and that that you would you would rather die than than not be with that other that so so that's one reason um another reason i, I say that that's the thing i'm most grateful for is because it really dramatizes and puts like right in your face that other phenomenon that you and i were talking about before about how you have to combine the transcendent with the imminent right that that there's a sense in which we're independent of our contexts, but there's a sense in which we're embedded in our contexts as well. And that it's to denigrate one or the other if you claim to be or focus only on the other or the one, right? Um, you, you need that, that, that bothness. Um, and there's no better sort of exemplar of that, it seems to me, than that kind of intimate connection with a beloved because um, you you are with that beloved through years there's you, you know that beloved in every you know phase of her existence or his existence depending on who you're with um, and you you see photographs of her as a baby or as a child or as, an, as a young adult or as a, 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 a medium aged adult or whatever and you see that on the one hand, she is all of those distinct phases, which are all embedded and all contextualized. And yet she's also the same throughout them all. And you, like, if I look at a, a baby picture of her, I'm going to think, oh my God, I, I love that baby. Like I want, you know, and, and, and I value that baby infinitely, but I also, I, I value whatever that soul or, or you know we, we we call the soul whatever we want to call it that that sameness that is is there in all those phases so there's a sense of which you you in a very in your face way you experience the love of this person in her particularity in her in in her with her traits with her characteristics in her embeddedness in her contextualization on the one hand and yet you also experience her context freedom, her sort of transcendence of that, of any of those contexts on the other hand, and actually living that, um, actually living that with another just makes it more, makes more real that sort of general truth that you could, you can, you can sort of appreciate even if you don't have this sort of intimacy, but, but it's, 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 it, it's much more right in your chest in a sense when you have it. So, um, that sound, it's such a long-winded and cornball-y sounding way of saying 
what lots of other people will say you know in a more kind of you know shorthand version by saying well first of all i would like to find i would like to thank the love of my life you know susie q or what um it, it it might be nothing better than a, a high church version of that that i've just said but um but that's how i see it it, it it's i mean there's just nothing that compares to it jay um, for, for me and uh, um all, but again i have to say it's, it's not like i've always had that my whole life or, or anything and, and you know you can you can get by without that you can you can you can do really great things so i don't want to you know i don't want to make it sound like oh you know you better you better find something you better start going on dates or something and find that special someone or else you're going to be useless i don't believe that by any means but but i do think that when when you do find that it, it makes everything so much different and and so much more illuminated from within that having it i can't not state that that's the thing i'm most grateful for there are lots of other things i'm extraordinary exceedingly grateful for um you know my the wonder the wonderfulness of my mom in addition to all of her flawedness the wonderfulness of my father and of my grandparents who raised me in, in, in addition to their flawedness the wonderfulness of my brother and sister um with their flawedness all of that too right um but if there's if i if i had to say there's you know if i had to pick one thing that i'm like sort of obsessed with every day. Uh, and, and in that sense, it's sort of constantly the coal that's burning in me um, in, in most sort of, you know, uh, deeply or most mo with most heat, it's, it's gotta be that. That's amazing. I love that answer in all its flaws and <laughs> its greatness. I love it. <laughs> um, Thanks, my friend. Thank you so much, Jay. And it's really been, you know, I can't even tell you what a joy this has been. Yeah, it's been amazing. I wanna thank you for coming on. Um, I, I'm, I'm sure the audience wants to thank you, but, um, from the bottom of our heart, thank you. Oh, of course. Thank you, my friend. Let's, um, I'll, so you can see what I'm doing here. <laughs> I'm uh, tapping my heart. Um, let's, let's do it again sometime. Um, and, um, and thank you. I just, again, can't thank you enough for this. And I just taken such inspiration from you and, and, and learned so much from this conversation. Um, ho hopefully there, there are many more to come. <laughs>